Hello, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the New Life Youth Council, and I'm glad to have you join us. Uh, I was re reading a quote yesterday, and it it alluded to the fact that uh, you you always have to prepare for opportunities before they present because most of the times you find that you if you don't prepare in advance then they may find you not ready and and we would just like to look look at the future of jobs we know with this uh virus th th things have been sh shifted up uh, people have lost their jobs others have to work from home uh probably industries that are that were thriving before are not doing so well and people really need to focus and look at uh different ways of probably ensuring that they are still able to 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 put food on the table so the youth the a new life youth decided that we can have a discussion and discuss around this theme and, and look at the future of jobs. I'm glad that you found time to join us and uh, I'm hoping that we will have a fruitful session. Uh, we will have the opening prayer and then I will hand over to Jeremy Riro to welcome the guests and then moderate the session. Uh, let's humble ourselves for our of prayer. We are praying, our Father who art in heaven, holy be your name. Lord, we are grateful for once again you have given us an opportunity to come into your presence. As young people, you have gathered us here to learn about the future of jobs. Lord, we pray that you may be with our presenters and the facilitators. Lord, give them is my prayer, trusting and believing in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yes, I, I would I would I now like to welcome Riro to introduce the panel and moderate the session. Welcome, Miro. Thank you very much, Chadwick, for the prayer and the introduction. My name is Jeremy Riro. I'll be the moderator of this, uh, for this uh, uh, evening. And uh, I would like us to, to really be very active. I like the fact that uh, our our speakers today, our panelists are very vibrant. Wamengiana Kishindo. So <laughs> keep it uh, alive all through up to up to up to the end. Uh, without much ado, so ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second episode of the Sunday Sit Down series. Uh, this series uh, of webinars is brought to you courtesy of uh, the Youth Ministry at uh, the New Life Seventh Day Adventist Church, uh, which is located on Fifth Ngong Avenue. Uh, on off Ngong Road in Nairobi, Kenya, of course. So New Life Church is currently having its services online, and you can find us on Facebook, you can find us on Twitter. Twitter, do we have Twitter? I don't know. I'll confirm with the leaders. But we have YouTube, and uh, you can download the New Life SDA Church app for you to for you to, to, to get the daily manner and the worship services that we have from the comfort of your home. Yeah. Having said that, uh, the series of uh, Sunday sit-down webinars by the Youth Ministry of New Life SDA is meant to complement the spiritual nourishment uh, that the youth get from other church programs that we have. And the goal is to create a holistic youth, like uh, my leader Chadwick has already mentioned. So the objective really uh, of the Sunday sit-down series is to create a safe space and bring youth together, uh, both in and outside Nairobi, to have honest conversations about our daily life experiences, ranging from work to our personal lives at home and elsewhere. And the end goal is to nurture a new generation of youths who, are, who have an understanding of the real world that they are living in and support each other to navigate through our personal and uh, professional life, lives in a, 
in a, in a judicious manner, basically making judgments that are right uh, based on the information that we have. And uh, having said that, allow me to quote uh, one of the biggest and best authors in history that I know, and of course most of us here might know her, her name is Ellen G. White, in one of her very famous book, I can tell Saya already knows what I want to quote. The book is called Education and says, <laughs> the greatest want of the world is the want of mm. men, mm. men who are bought or sold, mm. men who in their inmost souls are true and honest, men who do not fear to call sin by its right name, men whose conscience is as true to beauty as the needle to the pole, men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. Very famous quote there for Adventists, but do we practice it? Ellen White goes on to say, but such a character is not the result of accident. You have to be very intentional about it. It is not due to special favors or endowments of providence. A noble character is the result of self-discipline, of the subjection of the lower to the higher nature, the surrender of self for the service of love to God and man. She continues to say, the youth need to be impressed with the truth that their endowments are not their own, Strength, time, intellect are but lent treasures. They belong to God and it should be the resolve of every youth to put them to the highest use. I underline the word highest use. He is a branch from which God expects fruits. You are a steward uh, whose capital must yield increase, a light to illuminate the world's darkness, especially in times like the ones that we are living in. Finally, she says, every youth, every child, has a work to do for the honor of God and underline this, the uplifting of humanity. And that's the quote that I really feel carries or it embodies what we are trying to do with this uh, series of webinars. So it is based on the above fundamental truth that I've just mentioned uh, that we have gathered here today to discuss how best we can deploy our talents at our workplaces for the good of man and for the glory of God. And so, And so this is that the foundation on which we are going to start our discussion today. How can we use our talent for the best of humanity and for for God for the glory of God? That's what we want to focus on. And we want to look at it in the context of what's going on in the world today. And today we understand we have COVID-19 pandemic, and we also have whatever had started before even COVID came into being the transition of the global uh, economy into a digital economy and the disruption it was having in the jobs. And so faced with all these things that are happening, COVID itself, according to UNDP, they are saying it's going to wipe out about 50% of the jobs in the developing countries. So where does that leave us? We are Adventists, we work hard and we, we have jobs to keep, but some of us are going to be fired. So what does that mean to us? So today in our panel, we have uh, speakers who are going to speak into this, and they have all the expertise that you might want. So we brought the best of the best. So anyone missing this, tell them they are missing out big time and uh, invite them to join us before we actually dive into the wisdom that the speakers have. So first of all, I have the person who hires and fires. <laughs> <laughs> so we have with us uh, Professor, uh, Professor Dorcas Wainaina. No. Me and Professor Michael Wainaina. No. So that's Professor. Uh -huh. <laughs> but we have Dorcas Wainaina. Yeah. yeah. With us. She's well, the one who's in charge of hiring and firing. You could say hi to us, please, ma'am. Hi, everybody. How are you today? We are good. We are good. So, Professor Wainaina is the owner of the name Wainaina, and I belong to that one. Okay. Thanks for that clarification. Now, we are going to move next. Our next panelist is um, the person who gets hired and fired. And uh, that's none other than uh, Dolly Michira. Dolly, Dolly, you can say hi to us. Um, hi, my name is Dolly Michira. I hope I don't get fired. Yeah, sure. only hired. <laughs> Good. And finally, we have the person that we go to when we get hired for professional development uh, advice and when we get fired for psychological support. And that's not other than Saya Jackson. Saya, you can say hi to us. Hi, everyone. Hi. 
Now, thank you very much. Uh, those are my, our panelists, and uh, I've not really introduced them in the best way. I've just summarized it in my own way. So I'm going to allow them to introduce themselves as they give us their opening uh, remarks on this very topic. And as we always do, as we, already, as we agreed, is we are going to be very interactive. So most of the questions we want to bring them from the participants. And so we'll be following closely what's happening on the chat side so that we address those. We want to be as real as possible and help people out there. We don't want to really force content on people. We want them to ask us what they want to learn. Uh, so I'll give every of our panelists a chance, uh, starting with uh, Madam Dorcas, to give us their opening remarks, of course, a full introduction and uh, opening remarks. And then you're going to move to Dolly, and then we we'll go to Sire. From there, we'll now dive in into the crossfire of questions and answers. Over to you, uh, Madam Dorcas. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. I'm very uh, delighted to be with you this evening. Um, first of all, allow me to confirm that you can hear me. Somebody uh, confirm? Yes. By... Okay, fantastic. And you can see my face? Yes. And you, yeah, can, yeah. And you can see the flowers behind me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, I really love talking to the youth, so I'm very delighted that uh, I got the privilege of being invited. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, and, and again, I need you to know that I was a member of New Life Church for many years, from 1994 to 2017. Then I moved on to a different uh, fellowship. So that said, let me move to my professional life. I've been practicing HR as a profession uh, for the last 19 years now, actually, uh, since 2001, those are 19 years. So I've practiced uh, far and wide, and far and wide, I mean really across the continent of Africa, I've lived and worked in many other countries and come back home. In 1994, probably some of you are just being born or I, I didn't, been born or uh, I was uh, in 2004 I went to work in Darfur in Khartoum in Sudan during the Darfur crisis if you've heard about that <clears throat> uh, and so uh, I have traveled a whole lot in, in the course of this work and I say these things because you're youth and for me to have become the first expatriate black woman in that organization where expatriates were always white it took a lot of reading, a lot of research, listening to other people give me insights. And so that's why it's very important uh, that you hold such discussions. And so I commend you for that. And education is very important for you to continue to um, strengthen your capabilities and capacities. Uh, that said, of course, I've also led an institution as the executive director, CEO, the Institute of Human Resource Management, and I was driving the agenda of regulating the profession in this country. And so you can also move from where you're practicing and lead institutions as well. And that should be your dream and the dream of everybody else, not necessarily leading institutions. We are going to see shortly where we are headed and where the world is headed in terms of work. And therefore, uh, where I was, we were in employment. Where we are and where we are going is not necessarily the usual. Uh, you apply for a job, you get a job, you go to a big corner office and you're happy and everybody's happy and you keep getting promotions. Things have really drastically changed. And therefore, I want to dive into my presentation tonight uh, and then we can have uh, a time for uh, discussions. I know I was given 20 minutes. I hope I can actually do it within 20 minutes. But before I share my screen of my um, PowerPoints, I wanted to say this. In 2017, the International Labor Organization uh, created a commission, and it's called the Global Commission for the Future of Work. And I've delved a lot into the future of work, and I've interacted with ILO. And the last year, uh, to the ILO Centenary Celebrations in Geneva, we discussed a whole lot about the future of work and what that will look like for the youth, the future of work and climate change, the future of work and social relationships and inclusivity, the future of work and the governance of work, the future of work and greening the economy, the future of work and blue economy, etc. And that's a whole lot of discussion. And it's a whole commission that has employees, that has its director general that is leading that commission. And that tells you that um, at a high level, 
globally, there is uh, uh, importance that has been placed on how work will look like in the future, except that that future somehow has come rather quickly than we expected, and I'll delve into that. And so part of the study on the future of work is about the youth and their aspirations. You are youth, you are aspiring to certain things, you're aspiring and you have certain expectations, but who is helping you to get to that? And therefore, some of the challenges and opportunities the young people face, one is transitioning from schoolwork to, to employment, and it's becoming increasingly difficult, really, really difficult. The other uh, challenge that the, fa the youth are facing is that they are largely in informal employment and therefore, this is giving rise to instances of working poverty. You know, you are in unemployment, it's informal, it's not really giving you uh, an income that is decent and meaningful and helpful in your livelihood. And so you end up being a working poverty youth. And those are some of the challenges the youth are facing. But not only that, is that when the youth are starting out to work, their lives are less secure now, they don't have stable forms of employment, but they are also having obstacles in finding a job because they are not having opportunities to gain experience. And one of the questions in an interview set up is, do you have work experience? And then we are not giving them opportunities for these experiences. And, and in fact, the study by this Global Commission for the Future of Work found out that 42% of the youth say because of lack of relevant work experience, they cannot find work. But also that um, it's just about 5% that are finding it easy to find work. Perhaps they have good networks, perhaps they have influential parents or backgrounds, but the majority, as you've heard, 42%, they struggle to get jobs. That's a background to how jobs look like, how work is looking like, and as far as the youth are concerned, and this is a study that we started way back in 2017. And so we find ourselves today in 2020, where COVID-19 has incredibly changed our ways of life in ways we did not anticipate in December 31st, 2019, when we were putting down our resolutions for 2020. That said, let me now share my presentation with you so that we can follow through the slides. I hope I find a, a way to do that. Let me go back. Allow me get a way to share. I'm trying to to get yeah just go to the yes, bottom yes, right yes, corner yes. of the screen you'll see presentation yes yes, yes. Okay. i just want to get my presentation it keeps disappearing <laughs> you know that's what happens with age you know i can see the present now i am looking for where my presentation is i have now just found it actually i'm now sharing it i am going to presentation mode if you are seeing it say you can see that We can see it. Fantastic. Now, the focus areas I was given was on looking at how jobs look like, given the pandemic and post-pandemic, also looking at the impact on the future of work and the employee expectations, given the drastic changes that uh, we have all experienced. And I don't want to go into details. I am certain that you have uh, uh, gone through a whole lot of discussions on the pandemic, etc. However, it's an unplanned change. It was an, ex an unexpected event. It was rapid. It was sudden. It was drastic. We have various types of change in organizations. It can be an organization-wide change. It can be a policy change. It can be an unplanned type of change. It can be transformational change. There are different types of change that we experience in organizations, and this is one of those. This one's an unplanned change. It's an unexpected event. It's rapid except that it is magnitude is global it is a disruptor and it has disrupted so much it has disrupted us such that we are forced to work from home everybody is forced to work from home except a handful that are considered uh, the essential service providers social norms have been disrupted it's a barrier you die 
somebody dies today, they are buried the following day. You don't even feel like you mourned your relative, your loved one. There are no weddings that are being held. Of course, I have seen in our church, we've actually had a couple wed with about four people. So it has actually reduced the expenses on, on receptions and hiring the people to come and play the music and the dancing and all that come with, you know, big weddings. Uh, you know, uh, in fact, the Attorney General's office the other day just shut down people going for marriages at the office. You know, uh, we cannot meet together. We cannot go to church as we used to do that. Social norms have thoroughly, thoroughly been disrupted. What about technology? Why technology has not, it has been disrupted in the sense that it, this pandemic and the situation we are faced with has exacerbated the use of technology and various platforms. Let me tell you, I've moved from Google Meet, Hangout, Zoom. The other day I was using Floor, uh, powered by Odash from India, the Slack that I've learned about. So I have also navigated very quickly uh, in platforms of communicating with each other and therefore it has made us learn so quickly how to do some of these things. Let me tell you, in January 2020, I wouldn't even have used a screen to share like this. Health and safety has been challenged and the different public policy guidelines provided, sanitizing your hands, wash your hands all the time, wear a mask. We are being taught how to wear a mask. Of course, never mind. Some of us are not using it correctly. We cover the mouth, not the nose. We are putting it under our chin. We don't even wash it properly. We are putting it on our forehead. So we are being taught so many things. You are going to a bank, to a mall. A girl does turned a doctor. I have put a nurse or a clinician because they are the ones checking our, you know, you know, temperature. And sometimes I wonder whether they understand that they should take it and they check to make sure it's not 39 and then they report but they have turned to be that movement restrictions you know we cannot go home up country to visit our parents our loved ones you cannot travel from one town to another interconnectedness of global businesses now before the laziness that we used to face as countries in africa in all honest i call it laziness and you can challenge me later about that why would we have been importing you know masks gloves I think something is just really, really not right with us over here. And that interconnectedness that was disrupted has led us to become so innovative and very creative very quickly. And we are producing our own masks. I don't even know whether we'll go back to importing masks. And that is how a disruption has happened. Trade has been disrupted. We can no longer really get tomatoes and beans and onions that we used to get from Tanzania because now the border was even closed just the other day. But we are also talking about trade from other countries. These days I go to the supermarket and there are certain snacks my kid wanted and now I don't find them because they are meant to be imported and I say you know what Papa these things are not in the store today because they are supposed to be imported and now we are not importing no nothing and so disruptions such as those and just these are things that we have all experienced and seen but this has also impacted on work uh, and how it has impacted on work today and into the future is that economies will have to generate new occupations and we'll see those ones later on. It has caused some job losses and I use the word some um, cautiously because it's a whole lot of job losses but let me just use the word some for now. It will alter skills and the composition of most jobs. Jobs are really going to change and I can give just an example of a job like HR specialist which I practice you know if you are HR professional and you cannot analyze data and giving us insights that are meaningful to make decisions, then I don't think we will need you in the workplace. So everybody has got to rethink rather quickly. Uh, I know a lot of HR professionals have lately been struggling to come up with a policy on working from home or working remotely. And they're saying, oh, Dokas, what do we do? How do we come up with this policy? And like, you know, we can share information on how we can do this. I have had the privilege of working from home for many years, since 2006. I used to work from my house and I just go for meetings when I need to go and most of the time I was struggling anyway and so I have learned a few things about working from home but it comes with a high level of personal responsibility and accountability so skills are going to really to be altered in terms of the tasks and the composition and the competences we are requiring from these positions we are requiring HR professionals who've got to think on their feet because they have got to think about the well-being of their employees and what that means for the organization they have got to think about how organizations organizations are going to survive by ensuring that they are preserving whatever you know revenues they have so they can sustain businesses so work is really going to be impacted into the future what will 
the jobs look like. Let me delve into this. Are we going to have job losses? We are going to have job losses. Do we already have job losses going on? We have job losses going on. I can tell you, um, NCBA Bank closed eight branches, and they said they closed them for three months. Those are all people working in those branches that have gone home. Uh, they said uh, hotels the other days, the Norfolk that closed, Serena closed, but Pride Inn closed way back in March more than the others. And if there's any hotel that is actually functioning, there is none that is functioning. What is happening is that they are still holding their employees and paying them a salary as they hope that things will change because they also have got to contend with the legalities of simply sending staff home. In any case, the Norfolk hotel that just laid off all of their staff about two, three days ago, have received queries from government as to what their justification is. I mean, really, if they're not making business, can they sustain? Small uh, and medium enterprises are, are laid off staff. Some have actually sent staff home on unpaid leave because they cannot afford to pay them. The flower firms are actually having staff come in on shifts and, uh, and shift to work for their safety, but also shifts in terms of earnings. So if you earn a full salary this month, the following month, you are going to be on an unpaid leave. And these are realities just happening here in Kenya. The ILO has already predicted that 1.6 billion informal economy workers will lose livelihoods. Why? If they're not having people who have income to come and purchase items from them, purchase services from them, purchase whatever it is they are making at Gikomba because they cannot afford, they are going to lose income and so they will lose livelihoods and we know what that means uh but just the other day a month ago the u.s unemployment claim hit 3.8 million because in the u.s when you don't have a job you go in social care and social care is that you apply i don't have a job i'm not working i don't have income so i want to tap into the social benefits and so 3.8 million by april 2050 by now i am sure those figures have gone up freeze on employment all organizations today have frozen employment. The only organizations, the only employment that is ongoing at the moment is, is, is an upsurge in the employment of IT workers to help people like myself to set up work on these platforms and have conversations going to make sure remote workers are supported and that the assistants are going to make sure that data is protected, to make sure that the infrastructure to uh, keep confidentiality of the information as, as it crisscrosses the web, the sites and the cloud and all that comes with IT is protected. Salary cuts, salary cuts are happening. I think we know media houses have cut salaries of their employees. Uh, many institutions have cut uh, salaries for their employees. Some have come out in public, some have not. Uh, I think the um, East Africa Portland Cement is the one that did just announced that on Friday uh, and, and therefore several other organizations in this country are cutting uh, the salaries for their employees. and. Um, and this has come as really a, a desperate measure to make sure that people don't lose jobs, uh, but they can maintain a job at a lower salary to keep a livelihood going. Layoffs, there are companies that have laid off employees. I can just give an example of a, a cleaning uh, services company that uh, laid off uh, 300 staff just about last week, and that is in this country. And many other organizations are already planning layoffs. I mean, TV stations, media houses, are already planning layoffs of their stuff they cannot sustain. I mean, if people do not have a, a sustainable income, they are not going to buy newspaper. And so you're not buying newspaper like we used to do that. Uh, media houses, uh, both print and TV, are not advertising. And so there's no revenue from that. So they cannot sustain to keep staff on board and they can't afford to, to pay them. But there's also an impact on supply and demand in the labor markets. Uh, you know, the supply for skill, some skills is so high that the demand is now plummeting because organizations cannot afford to pay these workers at this point in time. But also there's an implications on full employment and decent work. And what is happening for some of these institutions is that instead of us sending you home, can we make sure that we retain you? At least you will have decent work that is meaningful and you'll put food on the table. So there's an implication in terms of what COVID has done. A decline in earnings, of course, if your salary is cut, there's a decline in earnings. And so your demand for certain services and products will also decline. And so the whole economy is impacted. I think I've already talked about the demand on IT workers. Uh, Post-COVID jobs, 
a survey, a global survey uh, done by the International Labour Organization has indicated that uh, post-COVID, the construction sector is the one that is anticipated to be a larger employer. And they can hire all sorts of people from clinicians to, uh, to IT people, to even HR professionals, to administrators, uh, to the general construction work people, because that sector is not going to be impacted like the rest of the sectors. And so construction sector is one of those that is going to continue to thrive. Uh, because sectors like the health sector that are highly specialized, you're dealing with human beings, for you to become a nurse, you've got to go to school to learn, have experience to do that. So we are not going to see a surge on that, except we have already in a country like Kenya, a, a lot of trade health workers that need to be absorbed into, into the jobs that now exist in the health sector uh, at the moment. Business forecasts is going to be on essential workers. Employers are really going to say, uh, are you essential as a worker for my business? If you are not, then I don't need your service. And so that focus is going to lead to a reduction in numbers uh, in the workplace. But we also anticipated delayed hiring. Uh, organizations and businesses have positions that they already had planned to hire for, but now they have to freeze that. So they will delay the hiring until businesses start making revenues that can sustain those positions. But remember, there are positions that are completely going to be altered, and there are positions that are actually not going to exist. Work has become human-centered, and that's a positive because it has now accommodated homeschooling and uh, child care and elder care. But because you are the youth, Perhaps yours is to stay home and they help your parents with one or two things here and there. You don't have children, and that is that's a positive in terms of, of post, in terms of COVID. Uh, while it's not a job, that work and home matters. Child care are now all intertwined because we are doing these things from home. Future of work. Future of work, how will work look like? And I, I have avoided calling it the future of jobs. It's really work. Uh, a job is a small element of what work really entails. The current, currently, the way we look at work is a place. What does that mean? I wake up uh, at 4.30, I get ready at 5.30, I leave my house, I get to my place of work by 8 in the morning. So you, work is defined as a place where you travel to, to go to work. Uh, but now we are now working from home, we are working remotely, it's a new normal. And this is not new in as far as research and discussions are concerned. Three years ago, like I mentioned, ILO, at ILO level, they were already discussing the future of work and the implications of technology for the work in the future and that technology was really going to be the driving force of work in the future. I already said that the future happened so quickly than we anticipated. And you can see how we are all scampering to make sure that we have technology platforms that can work. Safety measures for the gig economy. We know the gig economy is an economy that is not really defined, but it's working. We have the, the Uber, the delivery drivers, the ride hailing workers, meaning the border border people, Uber Eats, Glovo, Jumia Eats, all of these people that are delivering services and products to our homesteads, they form part of a gig economy because they are not they are not defined in terms of the framework, the legal framework of countries yet. But we know they exist. They do not really we do not really have a way of taxing them. Some of these workers are not really within the social benefits of the country. They are not even in NHIF or NSSF or pension with KRA. It's a border border rider. He delivers an item, you pay they go away but we are also you know seeing and we are going to see more of this e-learning curriculum and platform developers are really going to be of high demand where we are and where we are headed uh, i have been participating in quite a number of webinars we just hosted a two-day virtual conference and we had to quickly put this conference on that platform I, I, I mentioned to you called the floor, like floor, F-L-O-O-R, uh, 
powered by Odash platform. Some of you are in IT, I'm sure you perhaps know about it. And we were being supported by some young people from India as we ran the conference on, on 27th and 28th of May, that is just last week, but developing curriculum that is e-learning compliant. These are developers that we are going to need, but we are also going to see new service sectors come up. Customer service has really existed already, but we are going to see a more robust customer service uh, uh, um, a landscape uh, because uh, every business wants to make sure that the customer is happy because of the competition that is so high, making sure that you, you received your item, it was in good condition, it is the quality you expected so that you can have customers that are coming back twice, three, eight, four times and send you referrals. But we are also going to see new service sectors like knowledge management, I mean knowledge workers. Knowledge workers are people who have certain knowledge that is required for businesses to make certain decisions. And what we do not, what we, we have been having this, but not in the level of demand that we are going to need them where we are headed in the future, where we are going now. People in design, electronic media, uh, about a month ago, I know National Media Group has been pushing um, and advertising and pushing and advocating for people to log online and start reading newspaper online. So e-media print, you know, uh, uh, e-blogs you know, blogs and, you know, vlogs, etc. you know, wellness programs, e-commerce, you know, wellness programs, I'm sure you have been involved or you have seen people that are really now putting up gyms and, you know, places for working out, you know, people are really more focused on wellness. And so this, this is where our jobs are really going to emerge out of. But there are also new opportunities coming up such as offshoring for software developers offshoring offshore meaning you'll be based in kenya you are developing software for a country like sweden by the way that's already happening we have a whole about 10 10 000 to 20,000 kenyans and that they are being run by a friend of mine called michael uh, these Kenyans who are standard eight dropouts and these standard eight dropouts are now software developers for sweden and they do all of that from here in Kenya, and they're actually paid. They have an e-passport, and they're paid online for their services from here in Kenya. So they're existing, and these jobs are now going to show. They're going to become more and more on demand. Financial services are going to be more on demand. I mean, PayPal, Visa, uh, M-Pesa. Because I'm buying something in Amazon and I want to pay using M-Pesa, not necessarily PayPal, but this is we all have got to pay through PayPal as it is right now. But these financial services are going to become much more of a demand, especially because we are moving really from hard cash to plastic cash to, you know, to M-Pesa, you know, because we want to trade without the actual touch of money, hard currency. Uh, green economy is where the future of work is. You know, green economy, not conductive, the word is conducive. Green economy, green economy meaning we want to green jobs. And actually this has been part of the ILO agenda. How do you green jobs? You're going to make sure the environment is not degraded. You are going to make sure we have reduced gas emissions. And I think this has really reduced and I haven't looked at the research that is most recent. Emissions have reduced since COVID-19 started. We've not had planes moving up and down. We've not had ships on water moving up and down. And so much has stopped. And so it has slowed the gas emissions and the degradation has not stopped as such. Because I mean, if it had, we already had cut all the trees, if I use that as an example. And the flooding has already continued. We may continue to have um, heat waves because of you know drought and rising temperatures. But all this needs to be contained so that we can green the economy by creating jobs out of sectors such as agriculture that are impacted a lot more when we degrade the environment. Now, agricultural sector is where the future of work lies. That's where jobs are. And one of the things I was thinking of when I was coming to this webinar was like, if this, our youth can come together, go to the youth fund and get a loan and come up with um, uh, a greenhouses and put up what, French beans or onions or what, or, or turmeric and start exporting. And of course, I'm saying this uh, uh, in terms of having 
support from people like Export Promotion Council, having support from banks that make sure that they are not asking for uh, tedious documentation for you to access these loans. If you, if, if youth can get together that way and they are participating in this sector this way, they will create jobs, they will have jobs, they'll have incomes and we'll have improved livelihoods. But also we are going to see a lot in the change in the governance of work. We are going to see a lot of freelancers. It had already started by all means like in the last two years years uh, but way back in 2012 I know we have a website of simply freelancers and there are so many and they are used a whole lot and I know like in South Africa they use freelancers a lot through that website that I know exists we are going to see a lot of peace work peace work meaning we cannot afford to employ you full-time and we don't need you full-time anyway but we need you for three hours a week come do your job we pay you and you go away but also it's about contracting and the employment relationships you know if people are going to work remotely Facebook and Google already have said um, that in the next one year uh, until 2021 at least they they, they anticipate that all the work from home but also they have started working out modalities and policies to actually start hiring people from anywhere in the world you just need to be working from your home and deliver for them like google and therefore what that means what is that it impacts on deployment relationships so who do you work for you know you can be employed working uh for who for example let me say you're working for company for dockers but you also are working for google and you're also working for facebook because you're working from home but whose laptop are you using who when do you allocate time for google for facebook and for docker's company to work so employment relationships have to be redefined but exactly who are you working for legally which employment law is going to govern what you are doing so we are seeing this landscape of the future of work really changing but there are also jobs that we anticipate for the future like i mentioned earlier that jobs are really going to change the landscape is going to change and the large number of jobs that we are going to see where we are going post the pandemic are data analysts. People are going to get data, analyze that so that it makes sense and we get insights from that data to make business decisions. But we are also going to see a whole lot of specialized sales representatives. We are not talking about sales people just carry a briefcase and are walking around, but skilled in commercializing a new product. They are skilled in commercializing the fact that you can have an advertisement in the nation, the day nation that is online so people can understand that people who have the ability to actually commercialize or or sell a product about energy a product on telecom computer user support specialists are really going to be required because of remote work that is anticipated for at least the next four five years information security people organizations businesses want the information secured let me tell you two weeks ago when the parliament in south africa were holding a meeting via zoom a hacker hacked the system and was displaying pornographic content now we are looking for people that can make sure that the firewalls are protected so it related occupations are going to go up i already talked about software developers and for youth today because they have a malleable ability to quickly learn about things to do with it Developing software is something that uh, one should start focusing on right now. In any case, there are so many platforms and apps that are coming up and they are relevant to the work that uh, uh, we are doing today and to the services we need and to the products we need. So developing software is, is really going to be a job of the future where we are headed. So uh, construction managers, I think I talked about that. Heavy machinery drivers already in Kenya, there's a problem about people with ability to drive heavy machinery and tractors, physical therapy, health service managers, workers, but you can see those on the screen. Renewable energy, energy efficiency, recycling, uh, particularly recycling. If we can create jobs out of recycling, have you ever asked yourself now that we eliminated plastic, but we did not eliminate plastic bottles? still see them lying about and they're also clogging drainage systems how can we actually recycle those bottles that's where jobs of the future lie but we require an upgrading and an adjustment on our existing competences to be able to fit in these jobs and there are economies especially in the developing world that are going to struggle it's to even create jobs out of this profession that I just mentioned that are going to be of the demand in the future we are headed. And all of these are things that I have derived out of my interaction with the, the future of work and the Commission on the Future of Work and where we see opportunities arising for the youth to be able to be absorbed into 
uh, what are employers expecting uh, where we are going post COVID? We ex employers expect amicable discussions between the employer and trade unions. You know, trade unions are no longer going to sing. Uh, I forget the song they sing, but it's that song that they sing all the time. Oh, so and so. Solidarity uh, for who are they solidarizing for? If there's no revenue, your solidarizing are not going to have salaries and they are not going to have. Adu Pardon me? Adu mapambano. Ma, mapambano itakuwa, watajua wajui, hakuna mapambano. Kupambana ni kujua between this employer, we better listen, advise our members, please take the salary cut. You will be assured of a decent and meaningful employment, but you'll also put food on your table for you and your family. So we employers are going to expect this kind of discussion between trade unions and employers, not, not the fighting that goes on between trade unions and employers. The relationships are really uh, um usually full of tension. Employee flexibility in give and take situations just not long ago. Employees of K25, this is in the public, when they were, you know, um, uh, given the opportunity to have their salary cut so that they can retain their job, they went to court. I, and I understand that particular situation was not handled very well from my HR perspective where I stand. But we are going to anticipate a lot more of this, that, you know, you've got to be flexible as an employee, not to say, you know, I was employed to do this and this. This is really my job description. And so I like to stick to my job description as you know me. Which job description are you sticking to? You've got to be agile to take on responsibilities that will change because of the current situation we are faced with and go over and above what you're expected to do. But the give and take also includes that you are willing to take a salary cut so that you can manage and survive. You're willing to work on a shift. You're willing to be paid on shifts so that some get paid this month and, and you get paid the following month and stuff like that. You've got to be agile in learning. We've got to learn new things. We've got to unlearn the old things that we were used to and we start relearning new ones. And you know what? This is the situation right now. Even me, I've been under a lot of pressure, to be honest, learning this technology, switching to that Google Meet. And I'm thinking, Jim, are you guys not on Zoom? Why you, do you want me to use Google Meet? And I quickly had to get around it. I, I, I couldn't complain. I said, OK, I'm going to have that happen. But it is also going to be reduced spending on off-site learning. You know, these conferences. Materu, you are there listening. Materu is Chris Moravi. You know, the conferences, the seminars, the workshops where people take a flight. And Kenyans like to have per diem, public sector workers, and you have to stay in hotel in White Sands. These things are going to be reduced at least in the next three years at the minimum. And so e-learning is going to be the new normal of how we can acquire new knowledge for our work. Cost share, if you're going to be a remote worker and you will continue to work from home into the future, because one of the options we anticipate that will happen is that we will start hiring remote workers. So we'll have different benefits for them. We'll administer those benefits differently. We'll have got to manage them differently. And so we could say, you know, if you have your own phone then that is fair so we don't have to buy your phone do you have your computer so we don't have to buy your computer we can pay you for your part of your rent and you pay a portion of your rent because you're using your home as your office cost sharing is one of the other expectations employers are going to expect and it's already happening in other countries like in europe in switzerland where they say cost share like rent for your house because you're using your home to do the work of the office. But deliverables, employers are going, we have got to shift how performance is going to be managed. It's not going to be that there's a body seated in the office behind a desk eight to five. No, you're going to be working from wherever remotely, but you have certain deliverables, certain outcomes that we expect from you. And that will be the focus, you know, and you're going to be responsible, accountable and deliver your projects because we are not going to monitor you, but we can. There are actually a whole lot of tools, online tools that we can use to monitor employees uh, remotely. But what are the ethical and legal implications of that is something that has to be thought about. So as youth today, being responsible and accountable is very important, but also uh, employers are going to expect to have managers that are able to supervise uh, employees that are working away from the office effectively. Make sure that you are supervising them well, you're making sure they are okay, you're making sure they're delivering, they're not having challenges, and you're listening to them without even seeing their faces. And these are some of the expectations the employer is going to, to look for. And so, uh, because I'm rushing through my 20 minutes, I think I went over, but forgive me for that. I think um, uh, it's the information that was a bit a lot, so I would like to stop uh, at that. Thank you very much for listening to me.
Thank you very much, Dorcas, for that very, very comprehensive uh, introduction. I think you've just set the right pace that we needed. You've gone deep, you've gone wide. You just did an amazing work. Uh, this is a whole week seminar that we've just had, guys. There's a lot of content, and I hope we took uh, we took note of what uh, we have uh, we have heard from uh, Madam Dorcas. Thank you very much. So that laid the background in terms of the context, the global context, where are we, where are we coming from, where are we headed, uh, which was very insightful and very comprehensive. Uh, she then talked about um, what are the jobs of the future, how does the future look like, and uh, what are then the expectations from the employers and how should we fit into that. I think even if KPLC were to do their favorite thing right now, we would go home with a lot of good content. <laughs> But uh, of course, uh, we have two more panelists um, who I'm going to allow also to give their opening uh, remarks. And uh, like I had mentioned earlier, we are directly going to go to Dolly. We are coming from the person who hires and fires. We are going to the person who gets hired and we pray that she's not fired. So Dolly, <laughs> Okay, um, thank you, Riro. Um, I think employees have very little to say, um, so I will try and be very, very brief. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Dolly Michira. I work at McKinsey and Company, let me put it that way. Um, so that's my employer, but I'm currently on a four year break from McKinsey, trying to explore and identify where my passions lie and whether I can actually focus on that in a profitable manner. So, um, just to give you a little bit of insight, my passion lies in caregivers, family caregivers specifically, um, given or advised and significantly influenced by my journey as a family caregiver. Um, and so I'm trying to like create some noise um, and build an initiative around that so that we support caregivers as they take care of their loved ones and their patients um, at home. Um, and so for me to do that, I knew I needed healthcare knowledge. And so I wanted to move into healthcare kind of work. So right now I'm working at Financing Alliance for Health as a, um, a healthcare advisor to the government, working with the Ministry of Health. Um, and, um, and then I don't know where I'll go, where I'll land, but then school is somewhere um, in the plans. Um, but that's a quick brief or introduction about me. Um, and then, so um, I think there was so much pressure about coming up with PowerPoint, so I will also share a presentation um, of ideally where these things lie or what our advice is, um, or what I think my two cents are on positioning ourselves at the workplace, especially in this time of COVID-19. So I'll totally speak from an employee point of view. Um, and most of these opinions or perspectives are duly oriented. Um, so people might come up with different perspectives as well. Um, and so for me, it's always about how can you be the best version of yourself at work, at home, at church, um, because for me, those are the three kind of um, um, societal spheres that are existing. Um, and then, you know, how do we navigate working from home right now, the fear of losing our jobs and also exploring alternative job opportunities just to make sure that, you know, if, if I lose this, I'm, I'm able to transition to another opportunity. Um, so I will just start by maybe giving a picture, painting a picture of my experience currently with the COVID-19. Um, so we were working with the Ministry of Health, the Division of Community Health, to design the 2019 to 20, actually 2020 to 2024 Community Health Strategy in Kenya, which is a super, super, super inspirational piece of work for me. At least it opens up my mind to what the healthcare um, setup is like in Kenya, where the gaps lie, what can we do better, how can we improve? And also, <laughs> sorry, can you hear me? Oh, can you hear me? Can you see my screen and hear me? Yes, Dory, go on. Go on, Dory. Oh, okay. okay, sorry. Yeah, um, and so for me, it was just around that, like, then the transition to online for me has been super, super stressful. One, working from home is a scam because now I'm working longer, longer hours than I would have before. Um, because I think people assume Dolly is not commuting, so the commute period she's now working. It's been super stressful. And then it's much slower, as, as also um, as Dorcas has alluded to. Um, 
you can imagine the kind of people that work in government. Let me not say um, any any more or any further about that. And so transitioning to online or virtual way of working has been a super, super challenging situation. And so trying to get people up to speed, people to cooperate, people to work in this model has been super, super difficult. Because initially, as you say, it was a per diem kind of approach where let's go have a meeting at such and such hotel, write out the strategy and get it done. And now it's how do you get it done virtually? It's been very, very difficult. Um, so it requires and calls for a lot of discipline, a lot of problem solving on your feet. How can I make this work? How can I adapt quickly? Um, and how do I improve on the processes to just make them run smoother? Should I have one call in the morning, one call in the evening, just to make sure I'm on this person's face? Or should I have like one call per week just so that this person does not think I'm all over their, um, their staff all the time and micromanaging them? So it's quite an interesting balance. And I think for me, one of the key skills that has really stood out for me is stakeholder management. Like that is one thing you really, really need to get right because you will always deal with people everywhere. And it's very important to have a very good um way of managing people in such a way that it's not super stressful and not also very aloof that you know you you drop the balls on some things um, and so i will just take you to the next slide oh i think i need to put it on presentation mode so that everyone is able to see it. So for me, I think of this as the best of yourself, um, uh, best version of yourself kind of employee toolkit. With these four things, I feel I've been able to deliver the best version of myself and make myself indispensable at work. And this works pre-COVID, during COVID and post-COVID. Um, and I think these four things make sure our ensure that you're at you know you're at your very best even as you perform at work so the first element is self-leadership so do you do self-searching or self you know soul searching experiences do you know that it all rests with you do you realize how much power you hold individually and do you sometimes self-sabotage the second thing is to have a plan how do you know whether you're on course or not and the third thing is be yourself and be happy. That is the most revealing, I don't know, it's the most liberating thing for me, just to make sure that I'm my best version of myself. I'm myself, I'm very authentic at work. Um, if someone thinks I'm a kid, that's on them. Um, but just to make sure I bring the best version of myself. Um, and number four, of course, is to pray those things because I'm a girl of faith um, and spirituality is something that is very core to me. Um, so I'll deep dive on each of them. Um, for self-leadership, there are three kind of things that I look at. So it's the self-awareness. Are you able to know who you are and what your purpose is on life? Because that really advises what kind of jobs you enroll, uh, you apply for, what kind of, you know, as, as um, Dorcas has laid out a picture of the kind of jobs or the future kind of landscape of opportunities that, you know, are at place. How do I make sure that I'm positioning myself right? So I have to know where am I best suited to play a role in. Um, and so there's that part. So there's that part of being very self-aware and knowing yourself and knowing what power you hold, what's your expertise, what's your experience, what are you bringing to the table? Then there's a part of self-regulation, which is how do you overcome the negative instincts and your weaknesses? Because we all are not perfect. We have weaknesses, um, we have flaws, um, and sometimes you will know someone will tell you, Dolly, you're very good at this, but I think you need to improve at this. How good are you at taking that feedback? How good are you at working on it? How good are you at processing your emotions so that you don't sound defensive when you're receiving that kind of feedback? Um, and then the third element is the self-motivation or the self-discipline, um, which is how good are you at driving and delivering results even when you're not monitored? Because I think, you know, one of the things that also COVID has taught us is to become very autonomous and independent, to tell myself, Dolly, on Monday, I'm going to do this. On Tuesday, I'm going to do this. On Wednesday, I'm going to do this. And then on Thursday, I'm going to present this to my manager and tell them this is what I've accomplished. This is where I need their help on. You need to be like, I think one of the most valuable things that I was told, at least when I was go growing into my workplace was, Dolly, you need to transition from a parent-child conversation to an adult-adult conversation at work, which means I need to talk to my manager as an adult, not like, hey, I'm not going to my manager like he's my mother or my father, and they're trying to tell me what to do, but I need to go to them and tell them, hey, this is what I've accomplished. This is where I think the challenges lie. This is my thought process on how to solve these challenges. What do you think? What would you add? What would you change? 
so that in that way you're approaching the issue at a very adult perspective and they can see that you're someone who can take on more responsibilities um and then you have these kind of points of intersections yeah so once you are aware of yourself and you have high levels of self-discipline and self-motivation that is where your potential lies um, and then if you're able to regulate yourself and you have um, self-awareness, then for sure that is where you get your kind of responsibility. You take responsibility for all the actions, you take responsibility for your failures, etc. And then once you're able to be very self-disciplined and you are you have high levels of regulation of your emotions, more composed at work, then that is where your choice lies, right? Because you have choices for your actions, for your decisions, how you handle team conflict, etc. That is where it lies. And all of this, like this element is very, very critical, whatever your role, whether you're junior, whether you're senior, this is something that everyone needs to master. That is the art of self-leadership. Um, then the second point I talked about was have a plan, you know, know where you're coming from, know where you're at right now, where you want to go, and then back all up and enjoy the process, yeah? So as you can see, I kind of did a dummy, doily kind of um, work plan or timeline. Like, you know, when I was born, I didn't even know what life had in store for me. I was just a kid eating and enjoying and eat, you know, like just freestyle. And then you get to Dolly 2.0, which is me in my early 20s, and life starts getting real. I need to plan for the real world. I need to apply to a million jobs. I need to attend interviews. No one taught me to do that in school, and so I need to be getting ready for that, yeah? So that is now Dolly 2.0. I need to start to, you know, to think of relationships because I see everyone, you know, coupled up, etc. Then you get to Dolly 2.5, which is where I am at right now. You know, adulting is hitting real hard. I have increased levels of self-awareness. I know where I want to go. Like I told you, because of caregiving, I just became very sure this is what I want to do. This is where I want to do my life. Uh, and then based on that, I'm like, now what can, what can I do to make sure I am able to deliver the best services to these caregivers? I'm like, okay, go to school, do this, do that, get a job outside McKinsey, you know, do whatever. And for me that, you know, having a plan and knowing where I want to land at has been very, very critical. And then I also kind of have a, you know, plus 10 years ahead. I want to see, you know, maybe Dolly 3.0, which is in my early thirties. I need to be married, maybe. I need to be successfully running that social enterprise. I've gotten enough net networks, etc. And, you know, and then Dolly 4.0, I'm raising kids and, you know, I'm enjoying my 10th year of marriage. I don't know, whatever. That's my plan. But then always, because we are people of faith, remember that you can always make our plans, but God determines our steps and God has the final word. Um, and to always commit these kinds of plans to the Lord so that they can be established. You know, I think for me, the key point, which is what I put at the bottom, is once you know where you want to go, where you're coming from, where you are today, then you're able to shape your own career path. I can't insist enough or I can't emphasize enough on the need to be very um, independent and to be very initiative driven, right? Because no one else will tell you, Dolly, by, by year 10, you need to be here. You need to be the one to shape that path. And that is why self-introspection is very critical in the whole of this mix. And then I will move quickly. Being happy, which was at my third point, it stems from presenting the most authentic version of ourselves to the world. And so you shouldn't read yourself of that. And then there are a few quotes there. Because of time, I don't want to go into them, but I created this um, word cloud based on what I think are the most critical skills for us to have as employees to present to our employers. You need to be eager to learn, you need to be ambitious, you need to have very strong stakeholder management skills because you'll deal with people, you need to be someone who is very passionate, collaborative, you know, adaptable. So this is kind of the work plan, I, I mean the work cloud I created, but for me one important thing is be yourself. Never ever trade presenting yourself. I think my first two years at McKinsey were really nightmarish because I wanted people to see a different kind of Dolly. I wanted people, you know, people to see Dolly who is super, super, I don't know, a superstar or whatever, smart, does not ask questions, gets everything right, super perfectionist. And it didn't get me anywhere. It was actually very frustrating. Um, then my last two years at McKinsey, because I worked there for four years before I left, um, my last 
two years were very rewarding because I, I just let go of all those kind of um, conceptions or stereotypes. And I was just like, Dolly, you are fantastic. You know, you are enough. Just kick ass. I mean, just do your very best. Present your most authentic version of yourself. And I had a really, really good time. Uh, and I, you know, and the good thing is once you present your authentic self, your people find you. Always, always, always. I can't insist that enough. Like, you will always find your community somehow and you will enjoy working at that and you will be happy. And that is how you also start defining your purpose and your passion and your motivation to come into work. Um, then the other thing was now on the prayer element, which is always remember as um, our wise Mr. Solomon, or Solomon advises us that the whole duty of man is to fear God and to keep his commandments. For me, faith is a very, very critical element. Um, many times I have succeeded at work because I prayed. There are even times when projects went very badly and the partner would come and say, Dolly, see, you normally go to church, please pray for us. And I, I really like that fact that people see Dolly as a person of faith at work. And for me also that has opened doors and opportunities for me to keep the Sabbath without having any discussions with anyone. So this is something that is very critical. It should have even come first, but I felt like this is the way to like, you know, wrap it all together with love, with faith and kindness. And there are a couple of verses there. I don't want to go through them. But then the quote, there's a quote by Whitley Fitz. I hope all of you have listened to his song. Um, and this quote has really carried me through tough times in my life, in my career, um, and also helped me to present my vulnerabilities at work in a way that they were able to create opportunities for me to actually relax, let me put it that way, to relax and still advance with my career um, amidst the turmoil. Um, and Whitley Phipps say, um, states, it is in the quiet crucible of your personal private suffering that your noblest dreams are born and God's greatest gifts are given in compensation for what you have been through. So even in these tough times, if you're going through a difficult period, if you've lost a job, just know it's in this quiet crucible of this very suffering that your noblest dreams are born, that your purpose will be born, and God will give you very great, great gifts in compensation for what you're going through. Never forget that. Sorry? Okay, sorry. Then I wanted to finish with this. What about the future of jobs? I think that has already been laid out. Um, for me, I feel shrinkage of jobs will not happen. It's just the nature of work that will change. Um, for example, if today I sweep houses, um, tomorrow they will come up with that machine that sweeps houses. And so it's the nature of work will be how to operate that machine. I won't lose the job to sweep a house. I'll still keep it, only it will be to manage that machine. Um, and if they change and say, oh, now the machine can manage itself, I'll be the one to maybe set the timer, tell it when to start and when to end. So for me, I feel it's the nature of jobs that will change and not the role itself. So the volumes of jobs will still be there. And I advise us to stop being scared. The only way I feel we need to actually prepare ourselves and to plan ourselves around this is to understand what your motivation for work is. Where do you want to work? What do you believe in? Where do you want to go? And that really advises your future of work. So for me, it was just, I really want to help caregivers. So whether, you know, with COVID-19 or without, and if you've really noticed, very smart companies always adapt or um, adjust their strategies to suit difficult times. So case in point right now, Global Fund, um, they, their strategy is to fight HIV, TB, and malaria. COVID-19 came. They still respond to COVID-19. And they twist it and say, oh, if we don't respond to COVID-19, HIV, TB, and malaria, will, you know, their cases will increase. And so that is how you need to be smart about these things. Like, make sure there is a messaging. The way you message yourself really is, you know, what clicks. I can message and say, caregivers, right now in this COVID-19 situation, they're still suffering. You know, like, make sure how you message your idea and your motivation to work really suits the existing situation, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's automation, whether it's digitization, etc. The second thing is just make sure you are always learning. Like have a, an experience of lifelong learning. Make sure you develop the fundamental transferable skills. I have to admit, I'm truly, truly grateful to God. My first job was McKinsey. I don't think there's any other employer that would have given me the skills again that McKinsey that are super, super transferable um, and I can technically work in any sector. Like at McKinsey, I worked 
in the aviation industry. I worked in the energy sector, which I truly hate. I worked in healthcare. I worked in financial services sector. Like I worked across most sectors and in a number of countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And for me, it was very rewarding, just making sure I'm learning things that, you know, if today I'm thrown in the media and I'm told, please work on the education center, I, I am comfortable, even though I know nothing about education, because there are skills that honestly are very fundamental and critical, such that what Whatever situation you're put in, you can always apply yourself. Um, and for me, that skill for me it felt like it's the constant problem identification and problem solving. If I'm able to identify um, in this pandemic period, this is where the gap is. How do I address that gap? Like quickly knowing how to apply yourself in whatever situation, then that for me always keeps you a step ahead of whatever the future looks like. And then the third thing that I feel about the future of jobs, and I think. Um, Dorcas has mentioned it as well, is human-centered design um, of work. Like, I feel like now the future will be more humanized, right? You know, right now people working from home now understand what it is to be a mother. They now understand what it is to have two-year children, kids at home, shouting and showing up at the Zoom calls and whatever. And having that understanding for me makes it feel like the future is going to be more humanized. It's going to take care of the human nature more. Right now, people are coming up with all these podcasts about mental health. They now understand mental health is critical. It is a priority. And so for me, it just feels like the future for me is very promising. Like if Christ doesn't come, I feel there's more in store for us and there's more opportunity for us to apply ourselves to present the best versions of ourselves to the world. Um, and so let's not fret, especially if you're a Christian, to be honest, anywhere with Jesus, you can safely go. So let's keep peddling um, and I don't know, let's enjoy the ride, yeah? So don't, don't be careful. Um, and I think that marks the end of my presentation. I hope I didn't run over, thank you. Thank you so much, Dolly. Thank you so much. I think you guys are just taking it a note higher. Every time you say the next sentence, uh, the next paragraph, it's getting more, more informative, more insightful, and uh, I'm, I'm really loving this. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, if you thought that you had seen it all, you yet to hear from our last panelist before we go to the crossfire of questions. And um, that is none other than uh, Sire Jackson. So like we started, uh, we started with the person who hires and fires, and then we went to the person who gets hired. Unfortunately, she has not been fired, and we pray that she's not. Now we are going to the person who develops you professionally when you are hired. And uh, in case you get fired, he can still help you psychologically to remain stable and uh, just figure out your option. And so without much ado, I'm going to welcome Sire Jackson to uh, give his opening remarks, plus a, a brief introduction of himself in the best way possible that he, he would love to. And then we'll go to the question and answer after that. Welcome and over to you, Sire. Thanks. Um, if I was to describe what pressure sounds is speaking after Mongina and Mishira, and then that hype by um, you are truly. My name is Sire. My other name is Jackson. First, before I introduce myself, absolute privilege to be with two outstanding ladies who have spoken before me with both depth, understanding, knowledge, and clarity. And that is both inspiring and, and useful. God bless you tremendously for that. My calling, which is also my passion, is I come alongside institutions and individuals who are navigating challenging transitions and I support and work with them so that they do not give up on their vision, compromise their values or silence their authentic voice. I do this as a coach, as a trainer, as a speaker and as an author. I'm the author of one volume and I am currently working on my next two volumes. Interestingly, one of my immediate volumes that I'm working on is on the question of transitions. So quite an interesting time to be able to write on that. So I, I don't do PowerPoints for two reasons. One is pedagogical, that's a big word. That just means how people learn. 
um, because generally when you do PowerPoints, people focus on the PowerPoint and not on the learning. So I, I do that. And then the second one is I have, I'm legally blind. I have been legally blind from when I was in class four. And so I struggled to read PowerPoints. It would torture you. So anecdotally, I tell people, I pray to God to give me the power so that I can make the point. That's how my idea of PowerPoint um, kind of works. So just a bit of my background to help you understand. So by training, I am a life scientist. I did a Bachelor of Science in Zoology. I then got a master scholarship to do a Master of Science in Medical Parasitology. I did teach um, for some time. I was a research supervisor for various infectious disease programs. So I've worked in Kenya for American companies and for the University of Nairobi. I have worked in the Republic of Tanzania for the Ifakara Health Institute, which is almost the equivalent of Cambria or beyond here in Kenya. I have lectured at various universities. And then I've been able to have periods of study and uh, travel outside of the country. Most of you know me more as a pulpit preacher. So this is introducing you to the, when I'm not on the pulpit side. To be very honest, I think God in his mercy gave me a five to six years head start on everything that has been talked here because for the past five years, I have been working for a software, a remote distributed team of software developers. And what I was doing there was, I was in charge of um, learning development and management on the non-technical side for software developers. What basically I was doing was developing programs that develop the software engineers on their non-coding side. On their, so the whole problem solving, stakeholder management, cultural awareness, all those other skills that make you stay on the job over and above coding, which gets you into the job. I had the privilege of being nominated, uh, being elected the mentor of the year for this entire company, which was something phenomenal to be able to achieve. So splitting all my hearts, yes, and yes, I am on the pulpit from time to time. So I have been working remotely for five years. So when people are like, oh, future of work is going to be remote, I'm like, uh, is there another way of doing it? Yeah. So I've been working remotely, managing teams in Nigeria, Uganda, Rwanda, Kenya, right from my desk, having meetings, being productive and everything. So why am I saying that, especially last bit? I just want to bring us to a point of ease. You know what? I'm still here. I've worked remotely. I have a background in zoology, but here I was working in technology. So do you know what? You can acclimate. Do you know something? You can change. You can transition. And look, I was not struggling in technology, given I was not writing code, but given I was managing teams um, wherever I was, given I was being voted best mentor. So you know what? You can move from one side to another. Let me give you a few mindsets that will help you. Um, I was asked to speak on the topic. Of and let me begin by speaking about the three key attitudes or the three key mindsets that people navigate change with. Two of them will be unhelpful, one will be helpful. So the three key mindsets people go through change or transition with is, mindset number one is a mindset of complaining. The mindset of complaining. It's very simple, it's very rudimentary, it needs no training, it's very, it's core of the human heart. All you require to be a complainer is possess eyes to see, a brain to process, and a mouth to complain. That's all you, the, the basic toolkit, you need for complaining is that. And Kenyans, we even have phrases, we've built phraseology around complaining, like to Naomba Serikali, Serikali Ingilie. And we're always looking for who to blame. We are experts at complaining. Yet it is a ditch that somebody dug in the estate, the government was not there, a child fell in the ditch and broke the leg. Then we go on media and say, Serikali to Naomba Ingilie Kati, Where's the, where's the government to do that? That's just basically complaining, okay? The problem with complaining is it is a thief of focus. That energy you spend complaining, that energy you spend observing, that energy you spend ranting, robs you. Um, is, is energy spent, it's still gone, but it has not produced any forward motion. So 
the problem with complaining is it's a thief of focus. In life, we have not only a limit of the years we can live, but we also really have a limit of the willpower we possess. So we need to become very judicious how we expend it and where we expend it. Now, the problem with complaining as an attitude during periods of transition is that it burns away at the limited fuel um, of at the limited fuel of willpower that we really need and overtaxes it without producing any tangible results. So when a company is laying people aside, you know what, you can actually complain, but you know after, it, after you've complained, you still have your firing letter in your hands. It doesn't help. Attitude number two people navigate transitions with is the attitude of curiosity. I bet if I did a poll, um, currently, we are standing at 100 and something people on this call. Almost 60 of us, maybe 50 percent. That's a um, they say they, they say 90 90 percent of the statistics you hear are pulled off at the stage. They 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 have no basis in reality. They're just created there. So pulling off a number from my head, 50 percent of us are probably driven by curiosity. The people driven with curiosity have everything complainers have: an eye to see a mind to process lips that they could be able to use to complain, but then they add something more additional. They add their ears. They're always listening out to more pieces of data. But there's a challenge. They never convert that data into insights, and they never then convert the insights into action. So they go through, they gather tons of information. They now know about the future of work. They know how to reposition yourself. They, they're very curious, they'll jump from this call to another. Um, it, this is the weekend where, especially as Adventists, we, we, we are spoiled. We have, an, we, we, we have an opulence of riches in terms of programs that people can do. And a lot of us who are navigating this transition with a mindset of curiosity have jumped into all sermons preached by all Elkhoff preachers, have gone into all presentations made by all Elkhoff professional people. But you know what? That data has not been changed into insights and that insight has not changed into tangible daily actions. So whatever change is coming will come. These people will be very informed, but they will have taken no action. Because you know something? It is not the awareness that the flood is coming that makes you safe. It is the preparation you make with that knowledge that the flood is coming that makes the difference. So Noah preached for 120 years about a forthcoming flood there were people who probably lived as long as he preached. In terms of information, they were adept. They knew every detail of Noah's sermon. After all, it was the same sermon. So preached over for 120 years, there are guys who could preach Noah's sermon to Noah better than Noah. But you know what? When all the chips were down, it was Noah and the seven who didn't have just data, but converted it into information and into action who were able to save. So it's not information that saves it's preparation that we make with that information that will save. So the curious people will keep gathering information, but it will not help them much. So there's complaint, there's curiosity, and then there's a third level, it's called courage. Courage. Now the people who will approach their transitions with courage will be able to have two important perspectives. Number one, they see what is for what really is. So they're not blindly optimistic. They are not naive. They've not buried their heads in the sun. They see the situation as it is. They realize, hey, things are changing here. They realize, wait a minute, that future of work we have been talking about, this pandemic has just poured gasoline on the fire. And now what was meant to happen 10 years out will probably happen sooner. So there are people who are seeing the reality for what it is. But then number two, as Dolly pointed out, these are people with a clear sense of purpose they have a vision of what life can be. And they're caught in this tension between what is and what can be. But then they go one step further. They don't mark time gathering information only. They do that three letter word that makes a difference. They act, they act. They act in the direction of their dreams, knowing that product comes only after process. They act knowing that it is better to try and change a moving bus than to try and push one that is stationary. 
they act, knowing that the entire fleet of stairs is going to be covered one staircase at a time. They act, knowing that as they focus on what they are primarily best at, by being focused and growing in that step, they will create opportunities around themselves through which individuals who are better than them in other things can be able to plug in. They act because they know what is required in some cases is visibility that places you in the spaces that you need to be within. They act because they know people will do business and people will support people they know and people they like. And so if all they ever possess is the curiosity without action, they will not place themselves out there to be known. It's better to have faulty action than none at all. And so when they act and put themselves out there, there'll be people who will see them, people who will know them, people who will like them, and people who will engage. They act small, they act quickly, they act badly, they act soon, but for crying out loud, they act. Those are the people with courage. Granted, there's a difference between zeal and knowledge. The two need to be put together. We should not confuse zeal for courage. Zeal can be very naive. It can, it can light a lot of fires that do not cook anything, but burns out everything. That is zeal. But when knowledge is sprinkled or commingled with zeal, it focuses the zeal so that rather than it touching a building, it can be able to cook food. What every of the two presenters have said before is about how to concentrate the zeal of courage into something that will be harnessable going forward. So the three attitudes we will go through this particular time. It is either one, um, either one we will go through it complaining, two will be curiosity, and three will be courage. But I'm speaking on the matter of resilience. And I'm a child of the 80s. I was born in the 80s, the very, very early parts of the 80s. And so I've had the privilege of seeing quite a number of changes. One that sticks in my mind was when the ATM, the automated teller machine, arrived in Kenya. And bankers were frozen stiff. You know, we were told how this would eliminate all banking jobs. It would, you know, change banking forever as we know it. But here we are in as my lawyer brothers will say, 2020. Here we are in 2020 and the ATM is there and the banking jobs are not only there, but they have also increased. What I have realized with automation in my years of working in it is that when a certain sector of the life is automated, it frees up the human capacity to be able to create the next version. So the changes we are going through should not be changes that paralyze us, there should be changes that be able to free us up to do the next level of things. When we replaced the horses and the power they possessed with the horsepower of the motor vehicle, we imagined that that would be the end of ranching that produces horses. But no, when human beings were able to now travel faster and go further, they were able to create more and new things. So granted, let me tell you, six years of working in technology, I can tell you something for free. Whatever can be automated will be automated. That's a given. It's not a question of if, it's a matter of when, okay? So if you're in jobs like accounting, if your job's in um, law, where a lot of the things about creating memoranda and stuff can be automated, it will be automated. However, what that will do is for those who move from curiosity to courage is they will begin asking themselves this question, how, do I be, how, how am I able to use my training and my capability to move into the next space. The analogy I want to leave us with is that of a rubber band, okay? This is my, this is my mask, and this is the elastic that is meant to be thrown around my ear, so you're familiar with this. In order for us to build resilience, we need to remember the lessons we have had over and over from the rubber band, okay? Number one, when this rubber band is as I'm holding it, it, you never know it can reach as far as a lawyer's big head like this. You, you never know what it can be able to do, okay? So by nature, this rubber band is like this. But then for it to be able to stretch and cover this big lawyer's head, it needs to be stretched. 
So let me tell us something about the human nature and resilience is that by nature, we just don't like stretching until we are stretched. By nature, we just don't like stretching until we are stretched. I think there's one um, msemo that is wrong. They say necessity is the mother of invention. I think that's not really true. I think laziness is the mother of invention. But when you just really think about it, it's laziness at the core, that sits at the core of many, of many inventions. I mean, we got tired of lighting a fire, putting a pot, pouring the beans, warming them all over again. So we just decided to create a microwave. You get? I can cook with my pot, but a microwave is just, it's a nice lazier thing. So inherently, each one of us is lazy, each one of us. I think one of the most dishonestly written documents is our CVs. When I, I used to hire people, I have done recruitment, um, built amazing teams. One of the things I read and I see is dishonest in most lines of CV is on the side of hobbies. Hobbies, reading, hobbies, hiking, hobbies, um, lies. People's chief hobbies is sleeping. How do I know? When it's a public holiday, what do people say? They're not saying like, yes, now I can go hike. Oh, yes, I'll go read that book. No, people are just thinking, wow, tomorrow until 10, I'll be in the covers. Just by nature. We're just that lazy by nature. But you see, inherent in us, it is until, um, it, it, it is until Tesla came up with the electric bulb that we knew the potential of electricity. In fact, um, JP Morgan, who had invested a lot in the initial electric bulb when his father came and saw it, he told him, you've been played like a fool. When he saw the first electricity bulb at work, he was told, you've been played for like a fool. Now imagine what we know for today. So reality number one, when we are going through periods like we are going to transition, the need resilience is we need to remember this. By nature, we do not like stretching until we are stretched. And let me put one more thing there. We will stretch in the direction and to the extent of the thing that will stretch us. We will stretch in the direction and to the extent of the thing stretching us. If my little one-year-old niece is given this, her energy can just probably get it here. But when you put this thing on my head, it'll stretch to as far as is possible. Why? It'll stretch in the direction and in the niche, in the direction and to the extent of the thing that will stretch us. So the question is, all of us are being stretched by something. What are you being stretched by? So reality number two is inherent in reality number one. We therefore need motivation in order to stretch. Because by nature, we don't like stretching. We don't, we're not resiliently built, okay? The, the, the capacity to be resilient is in us, but is often covered by a lot of other inherent things and cultivated things that suppress our ability to be resilient. For this ability to be resilient to emerge, we need motivation in order to be able to stretch. In the Christian circles, if you grew in Pathfinder in Adventist church, you hear of the term that says, for the love of God constraineth me. A nice way to rewrite that is, for the love of God stretcheth me, okay? So we need motivation in order to stretch. And this is a deep thing. It's not, not motivation for motivation's sake. No, listen very carefully. If the motivation to be resilient in this period is fear, you will not go very far. Because Corona will end, a new world will emerge. The fears that are driving you now will cease. And once that is gone, then the thing that is motivating you is gone. For the Christian, at least for a majority of the people on this call, there's the additional layer we are given, which says that everything we are given and all we are is given to us as a test, as a trust, and as a temporary assignment. That all we are, we will respond to God, but also all we are, we are given to better humanity, to better the face of the earth. And that is why I could not agree any more than the understanding of our purpose. Now listen to me. We hold our plans, but our purpose holds us. We hold our plans, but our purpose holds us. And the problem with plans is they change, okay? My friend Chris is on the call and I've heard him talking about his plans to marry this year, which he did not consult Corona and Corona told him, we don't do that here. You know, Kuoa and the guy has to remain a bachelor until Corona says otherwise. You understand? 
he holds, he holds a plan and the plan keeps changing. But then Chris has a purpose he pursues in life and that purpose keeps holding him now, even though his plans for marriage have been gone. And so if we are going to be merely motivated by basal things like fear, by basal things like showing off, by basal things that being just a bit better, being the being number one in dwarfs, as 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 as, as Yoweri Museveni once said when he was asked, "Do you think Uganda is better than Kenya?" And Museveni, with his very Ugandan accent, he said, "You know, all of us are pygmies. Uh, that is we are saying pygmies. All of us as East African economies are pygmies. So it is fruitless to ask me which pygmy is taller than another pygmy." And he had a point. He had a real big solid point. At times, the thing that motivates us is I want to be the tallest pygmy. Yet you don't know there's a possibility to be a giant. So I cannot stress enough the need to understand your purpose. Because when we are going through this, for us to build resilience, the mind does not think without a picture. And the mind will only think proportionate to the picture that is put in front of it. Certainly, that picture has to be painted with the colors of reality because it does not help the mind to dream on a paint that is painted out of reality. But we need to be, begin thinking of something beyond fear, something beyond survival. We need to begin being driven by purpose. So resilience, tip number two is, we need motivation in order to stretch. Now, when this rubber band is like this, it's, it's really harmless. For boys and the mischievous tomboy, tom girls, tomboys who are here, when you stretch this thing this way and attach a paper on this side, this thing converts to become a weapon. But more so, in its stretched condition, if I bring a rubber band, I mean, I bring a razor blade close to this rubber band, it will snap way more easily than when it is in its rest state. Okay? So this is a third reality. And why many of us will not build resilience is this. We are most vulnerable when we stretch. We are most vulnerable when we stretch. It is very easy to just exist, to go through things that way. But those who decide to stretch will step into the realm of being vulnerable. And it is this vulnerability that makes many people shrink into the familiar, including the familiar failure. So if you're already feeling like, okay, I'm stepping up a new level, in this resilience game and you're feeling vulnerable, I don't want you to shrink from it. I want you to lean into the vulnerability and understand that is part and parcel of the process. And listen to me good. You see, when you get the crown without the cross, the result is you are not able to handle the crown. The cross prepares you to handle what comes with a crown. Those who want to stand in the limelight must remember that the same physics principles responsible for the generation of light that they want to stand under are the same principles that are responsible for the generation of heat. And so often is the case that before you can take the limelight, you must be prepared to take the heat that often precedes or comes as a package of the limelight. But very often, when we are going through the vulnerability of our transitions and the resilience it builds, we want to shrink from it because it's uncomfortable. No, that vulnerability is going to be important to you so that when you come to the next level beyond your resilience, when you come to the next level, that experience of vulnerability will make you be able to give yourself permission at the next level because you have known the horror of the trenches, then you can be able to fully understand and appreciate the privilege of being at the table. As I've said once, and I've said many times before, all things that are worth having in life are built. They are not bought. And they're built, in the words of Winston Churchill, with blood, sweat, toil, and tears. So if you're feeling vulnerable as part of your resilience, please don't shrink. It's part of the package, and it's preparing you for the next thing. Three more things to say. So number third last. Since we are most vulnerable when we stretch in our resilience process, we need affirmation. We need affirmation when we are stretching. 
This speaks to our need for community during our process of building resilience and living through times that call for resilience. Um, as I've introduced myself, I do a lot of coaching and yes, there is, um, I, I, was, I was keenly looking at um, Mrs. Professor Wainaina, that's just a, a joke. My wife is currently doing her PhD and if, if you've seen my wife, she really looks young. You know, I keep telling her, hey, I have a bald head and I work with you, one day I'll be arrested. So I keep telling her, it's okay, since you'll be called Mrs. Sire, you'll one day be called Dr. Sire. So when people will come and see the two of us, they'll come to me and say, Habari Dr. Sire, because I have the bald head. Then they will say to Habari Mrs. Dr. Sire. You know, so it's a, it's a, it's a good thing. So one of, I was keeping on looking at Mrs. Professor Wainaina's slide about the next jobs. And I think one of the jobs that really will be there are the jobs in the support side. People who do coaching, people who do mental health is a real big need as people make that transition. And one of the things that is creating that is because people are not getting enough affirmation. People are not trying enough, getting sufficient and the right kind of feedback so that they build the muscle and the affirmation they need when they're going through their transition. So this speaks to the community now. If you're in a community that is an echo chamber, by echo chamber I mean the thoughts that are in that place are the same, then you're probably not in the right place. If the two of us are saying the same thing, one of us is irrelevant. Many of us are scared of challenge, but though challenge is what is able to drive us to the next level. So the next reality about building resilience is we will need affirmation. Let me say two things about that. Number one, let's not be there for stingy with our affirmation. When we see people stepping out, when we see people putting their neck out, please, let's give them the affirmation. They will need it. But number two, let's not be vague. Vagueness is not friendliness. So if my friend is trying a thing in singing and it is very clear that Mziki Sio Mudomo Chake, give them positive feedback, but just tell them to try their talents elsewhere, okay? It is not friendliness to keep encouraging them in something that is clearly, oh, my, my nephew wants to be a doctor. Every time he sees blood, he faints. As a responsible uncle, I need to tell him, no, medicine is not your calling. Okay, I'll tell him in way more kind words than that. You can't be fainting every time you see blood and we hope you will go through six years of medical training. It does not work that way. So we need affirmation when we are going through our resilience moments, but affirmation is not synonymous with vagueness. Affirmation is not the same as being in an echo chamber. Affirmation is being with people who challenge you to be the best version of yourself while giving you the right balance of support and feedback. Second last, few of us will be resilient because few of us will stretch. Few of us will be resilient because few of us will stretch. But the few of us who will stretch will inspire the rest of us. Few of us will be resilient because few of us will stretch. But the few of us who will choose to stretch will inspire the rest of us. Just think about Eliud Kipchoge. I do run, okay? That's part of the package that comes with marrying a challenging lady. You add two, two milligrams and you're told, Halei, two milligrams, you know, you just have to run. Eh? And I just watch him doing the Ineos 1200, the Ineos challenge, you know? Um, and, Eliud, the time he spent running 42 kilometers is what I ran a good 21 kilometers in. But you see, I liked the theme he gave at the end of the day. He said, no man is limited. There probably were other runners would be better than him. I personally think the late Samuel Wanjiru was a way better marathoner with a more promising future than Eliud. But what made the difference? Samuel did not stretch. He ended up dying too young. Eliud did stretch. And now because of Eliud, we have that theme and mantra going with us that no man is limited. So few of us will stretch, but it is the few who will stretch who will inspire the rest of us. 
Sadly, for the few who will choose not to stretch, one day, as we will be facing the cold hand of death, that potential, those capabilities that have been put in us, will be asking us that question. We were given to you to give life to us, and you didn't. And how that begins expressing itself, you see it in parents trying to live their dreams through their children. You begin seeing in employees, especially millennials and now Gen Zs who are very restless at work, it is because they have genuinely not been able to stretch in the right directions. So it's up to you to choose whether you'll choose to be resilient and inspire the rest of us or just dormant and go through life. I had a quote in my campus days on a calendar that says, there are three sets of challenges, simple, difficult, and impossible. Those who take simple ones will have a comfortable life. Those who will take difficult ones will have a memorable life. But those who take on the impossible will change this life. So the choice is yours, whether to take simple, difficult, or impossible. And then finally, just imagine, again, just going back to my in-law, Eliud Kipchoge, the final one kilometer. He's been running the 41 kilometers with pace setters. And I'm a biologist. I can tell you what was happening in his body. I, the lungs must have been having a discussion. The legs must have been talking to him. The eyes must have been telling him, no, cut it, you know? And then the final one kilometer happens. And you see that image when he tells his pace setters give way, you know? And now he begins doing something that still puzzles my mind. You still see him pumping, he sprints the final one kilometer. You know, he has the energy and presence of mind to point at supporters while sprinting and all the way to the final beat. His body must have been telling him, cut, I'm, I'm done, I'm spent. But then imagine when he cuts that line, gets that hug from his wife, and he has that very challenging green on his face. The 42 kilometers of punishment and torture at that moment are gone. They're forgotten. They're behind him. You know what that tells me? Your stretching moments will soon be your finest moments. Your stretching moments will soon be your finest moments. So when you're going through them now, they don't feel like it. As a child, we, I grew up in a very disciplinarian family. Um, I think most Africans did, you know, where um, the, the, the road was um, administered without fear, favor, and very liberally. And I think as a child, I reached a point, now looking back, I probably was traumatized. And I one day asked my elder brother, Chief, itakwanga hivi kila siku. When my bro, my bro is just a year older, and I don't know where he got this wisdom. He told me something deep. He told me, just remember last year, a time like this. Was there something you were worried about? Yeah, yeah, definitely something, a lot of things I was worried about. And then he told me, are you worried about those things now? I told him no. And then he told me, next year, a time like this, you'll not be worried about this conversation we are having. We were in primary school. That's why I don't even know where my bro got that wisdom from. And that thinking has always stuck with me, that no matter what challenge we are going now, the mind of the resilient reminds them, Niamuda too. And one day we will look back and the things we are worrying about today will not worry us. One day we will look back and the thing we will have deepest gratitude is that we chose not to complain, is we do not just stick in, in curiosity, but we have the courage to do something. And one day when we look back, we will realize not, those moments I felt vulnerable, those moments I needed affirmation were my finest moments. They not only built me for the future, they also allowed me to go through the process so that when I reached the product, I was a prepared person arriving in a prepared space. What are my thoughts about the future of work? My thoughts on the future of work are as follows. Number one, the future of work will be nailed by those who will be lifelong learners. It will be nailed by those who are lifelong learners. And lifelong learning is a discipline that I have spent a lot of time into. And its key driving thing is this. It is people who have not married themselves to a label. They're not married to label HR, label engineer, label. No, they are people who are married to a course. 
The question their lifelong um, person is asking themselves is not what do I want to be when I grow up? The question a lifelong learner wants to answer is this, what problem do I want to be used to solve? For which people, in which spaces, and as a result of my contribution, what will they be enabled to do? Let me repeat that. The question a lifelong answer is always asking is, what problem or pro problems do I want to be used to solve? For which people, in which spaces, and as a result of my contribution, what will those people be able to do? So the future of luck will be nailed by people who will embrace the idea of being lifelong learners. 11 years ago, the first iPhone was released, revolutionizing the whole arena of smartphones. Now we have people called YouTubers. If 11 years ago, your father asked you what you want to be and you said, I want to be a YouTuber, your house would be changed immediately into a house of prayer. Elders would be invited because this child is a waste of school fees. You know, easy to an atambia to a live. But right now, some of those people are making way more money than engineers or people who stuck to labels are. The way the digital revolution is changing things, labels become of less value, but problem solvers become way more valuable in the economy we are going to. And so two things that cannot be divorced in the future of work is that it will need lifelong learners, but then it will need people who are resilient all through and through. Thank you, guys. And may God help us to become resilient, not just complainers, not just curious, but to have the courage, like a rubber band, to be stretched, to be vulnerable, to be affirmed. But one day we will look back, having inspired others and realized our stretching moments were our finest moments. God bless you. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Saya. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you very much. So I believe we have all learned uh, a lot. I have my notebook here. I think it's almost full. And uh, I, I still feel like I want to continue taking more notes. So thank you very much to our panelists. That was very informative. That was more than we had paid for. OK, we had prayed to go to pay you guys. but. How much you had prayed for him to pay you? <laughs> we, I think uh, you just you guys have just exceeded it uh, by 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 a lot. And so uh, at this moment, what I want us to do is to just jump right into questions that have been sent across. And I know more questions are going to continue coming through, uh, so that I don't add my own interpretation of what has been shared and I end up diluting it. So I just want people to interpret it in their minds the way they have received it, and they ask the question um directly to us so i'm going to go to the few questions that uh, had already come in earlier and then you're going to take in other questions as they come and so the first question was asked by helen uh, g white uh, at around uh, 7 40 when we were starting and her question was uh, focused on uh, the education system and this was a question how do you foresee this affecting and the question goes, the disruptor has greatly affected our education system. How do you foresee this affecting the current and future youth and work? So that question, I believe, uh, is uh, most uh, suitable for uh, Dorcas to, to handle that. And then there is another question that was asked by Elvina Majiwa at around 7.45 p.m. And the question was, what are the top hard and soft skills that employers will seek post-COVID-19? Again, this one I want to divide between uh, Dorcas and Dolly to, to answer that. Uh, the third question, uh, so that we answer three of them and then we move to the next, is uh, from Rael Akinyi at 8, that 6 p.m. The question was, how do you motivate yourself to stretch till your farthest length? And this one is directly uh, headed to Brother Sire, of course. 
And uh, Kemunto Ondemu at 8, that 8 added to that question by Ryle by asking, adding to Ryle's question, what are the practical ways to changing mindset? And again, I would like to bundle that to Ryle's question and uh, push that to Sire. So starting with the first question uh, by Helen uh, Dorcas. I didn't get the last question. Uh, it was breaking quite a bit. Oh, sorry. So the last question was, uh, how do you motivate yourself to stretch till your farthest length? And there was an attachment to it that says, adding to Ryle's question, what are the practical ways to changing a mindset? So I bundled that into one question. The first one was on education. How do you foresee this affecting the okay. current and future um, human world? A lot maybe you, you can hear me. Um, yes. Let me go on the question of the education system. Uh, indeed, uh, we started this conversation, I know, and I've been involved in it in 2017. And this is a big problem uh, in Africa, particularly, but if I narrow down to Kenya, it's a big problem. There's a major disconnect between the education curriculum, the curriculum in the education systems that we have, and the needs that the employer is looking for, that is what the industry is looking for, the jobs that are in the market. And that has been there the past three years. So post-pandemic does not mean that things have just shifted. And then so in Kenya, we started the conversation on competence-based curriculum, CBC, ETC, TC, it was to be implemented, and computers in primary school, etc. I'm not so sure where that is at, in all honesty, and I don't know how much we're moving forward about that. So in terms of curriculum that is offered in our institutions of learning, what is being given emphasis now is the technical vocational education. But the technical education of vocation uh, through Tibet institutions is actually a mandate from the International Labour Organization that has been ratified by countries. And that's why you're seeing Kenya today talking a lot about Tibet, you know, vocational training and education. The challenge is that when you come to industry, when you come to employers, but sadly, when you come to HR professionals that are the gatekeepers of who comes into the organization, the challenge starts right there. You have a higher diploma and you're very well skilled and competent with demonstrable abilities on social marketing, for example. No, let me take engineering, something solid that we can identify quickly. The advertisement they will put out there will be a degree, bachelor's degree, master's program is uh, desirable or preferable with two years or three years of experience. Right there, if you came from Sigalagala Training College and you actually have the competencies, you have the practical skills, you have been trained for it, but you have a higher diploma, Obviously, you're not getting to the shortlist, and that is the reality. In fact, we don't even look at your CV. In fact, the recruitment online tools that we are using already shifted you and took you to a, a bin that belongs to not qualified. And that right there is a problem that we have in this country, is the problem of the disconnect between education system and, and, the, and the industry. But it's the problem, and for me, it's an indictment on the part of HR professionals that should be thinking differently and dynamically and start advising employers where they're working that we should focus on the skill and capability of the youth so that we can bridge the gap of unemployment that keeps widening. But let me move to another point for you, the youth. When you are coming out of an education system with a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology, or let's just say Bachelor of Arts Economics, and industry, or a Bachelor of Arts in Pure Mathematics. These are the kids I just interviewed last year uh, that are now uh, you know, undertaking their internships in the public sector. And I interviewed a whole lot with a Bachelor of Science in Pure Mathematics. And I wondered, Pure Mathematics, why is that taking you today? Like exactly where you're going to intern right now? And let me tell you something. I had to keep advising them that they have got to know 
where that pure mathematics is taking them. What industry is looking for that unless they are going to teach, but they don't have Bachelor of Education, so they do not have the, 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 the methodologies to teach, you know, the pedagogy. I mean, train teachers, you know, schemes of work, lesson plans, etc., and, you know, you go to teach. What that leaves the youth with is to seek other avenues that can give them the practical knowledge required in the industry today. That's why somebody leaves university with a Bachelor of uh, Commerce in Accounting and then they pursue CPA and then they get into the job market. So you've got to get into professional, um, additional professional training to be able to handle the work in the industry. In addition, you've got to seek for opportunities for internship, and I'm glad I've got this opportunity to tell you, please, you know, apply for internship programs in the United Nations as a body because they have a robust internship program. I did my internship in the UN before, and nobody should say, oh, you know, those bodies, you should know somebody. I have never known anybody in my life, to be honest, except God, and that's the truth. My life journey is a different story altogether. Just recently, I think uh, this week, I received a whole lot of uh, links World Bank is taking on graduate interns, and you can only be taken into that internship if you are born between 1988 and above, obviously. The rest of us, 1988, we know where we were. Sire should not even try that again near there. But the rest of you, do you know that there are all these opportunities that can give you work experience? And then we keep saying we don't have work experience. Do you seek these opportunities? Go to these websites. They actually have graduate internship programs that you can apply. The United Nations right now is actually calling for young graduates to apply for job opportunities that start at lower level. So please capitalize on that. Let me go to the top skills quickly uh, that employers could be looking for. Uh, from you or what we are looking for from you know the younger workforce that come into work today first of all the youth <laughs> they most of them do not understand that uh, we work in collaboration so we work within a team so they sit with their laptop alone they work they go for lunch come back behind their desk and they're working and they go home no we don't need people like those you will not succeed you will actually be a loser and you will lose quickly you've got to learn to interact with other people and work with other people i have brought on board interns who come and sit at their desk they don't talk to anybody they just say morning morning sit finish go home and they think that's how it works so what we spend our time on is coaching them and guiding them how to interact with other people how to even make sure that they take tea at 10 when tea is served stand up go to the dispenser and get some water and drink because that way you're stretching your muscles and you're exercising you don't want clothes while you're sitting in the office collaboration you've got to collaborate with other people and that means you know be part of a team player work in collaboration in conjunction with other people be agile be quick to learn others come because they want intern in accounts if they ask to do something in admin they say oh no i'm an intern in finance so i'm not an intern in in, in accounts uh -uh. you you will not even get a job when we are giving recommendation we will say you know what you have a long way to go in learning to be able to handle multiple responsibilities that come your way because that is the way you gain a lot more of experience so be, be agile and you know uh, go extra an extra mile you know use your discretionary effort to do the work that you're asked to do but you're also looking for individuals that honestly are, are, are like what dolly said people who are just happy nice individuals who have high level of interpersonal skills you can interact with people you can crack a joke and you can laugh and those it people who are always too serious until your faces look like a computer you know shape of a computer please learn to smile especially when you are introverted it's very difficult i told you earlier i'm an introvert myself and i've had to learn so hard to come out of it and start cracking jokes and you know laugh with people interact with people otherwise you will lose it so interpersonal skills be able to laugh interact with other people make a joke here and there if you don't know how to make jokes but at least laugh at the jokes of other people don't be too serious because then so that you can look you're more you know serious and academically um angled you know it doesn't work like that how to motivate yourself oh gosh there was a question on how to motivate yourself first of all when you wake up in the morning take a shower okay before you take a shower let me take you how to motivate yourself workout exercise let me tell you me though because i've always exercised every morning i exercise i jog i do sit-ups these days i'm doing squats don't even ask me this COVID 19 period exercise take a shower please remember to drink water 
keep stretching, keep telling yourself, no, you know, I have got to learn one or two things. I keep reading all the time. I scribble things everywhere. My desk, you will see a whole lot of things that I scribble all, all the time. And when you are not motivating my, yourself intrinsically, you are not energized, you are not motivated. It's because already you are tired. Your muscles have tension because you don't exercise. Let me tell you, when you exercise and you feel fresh and you're energized and oxygen is flowing to your brain, you become more creative as well. And I can see Riro is looking at me, but let me stop at that. I could have gone on and on about how to motivate yourself. Read your Bible, of course, before you go. I have a whole regimen of things of how to motivate yourself. Read a book, you know. You read your WhatsApp, but you keep reading only those jokes that you receive on your WhatsApp. That is not what it means to be tech savvy. You know, some of you think by using the phone the way you do, that's being tech savvy. You are just computer and phone savvy, but you're not tech savvy. So you need also to learn the differences of those things, how to motivate yourself. Did you realize that I really dressed up to come to this webinar and it's a Sunday? Somebody actually asked me, why did I? I, I think it was Wayne who asked. I said, Wayne, I was coming to seriously Thumbs present up. to you in a webinar. So I had to look the part. So I'm self-motivated. So motivate yourself to don't wear a t-shirt and savage like that and you're coming to a webinar like that. So you're not motivated already. Like I'm serious about that. Jeremy, stop laughing like that. But I'm so serious. I thought you can laugh about it, but really seriously. Did you see I even made my hair? Like seriously. Thank you very much, Dorcas, <laughs> for the answers and for the motivation. And also I took my time to dress up for this. This is called the CEO. We are pre-code, cartel, and focus. So <laughs> I also took some time. So I'm, no. I'm moving very quickly to, to Dolly. Uh, uh, I want to apologize to all the participants who are here and seek your patience for at least uh, an additional 22 minutes because we have very critical questions here. And I know as speakers, we might not get them sooner. So we want to means, uh, get all the juice from them today. So Dolly, if you can uh, jump into the same question uh, that uh, Dorcas has been uh, uh, addressing, the hard soft skills uh, that we need uh, to, to, to really stick within the job market and uh, be, be the kind of employees that uh, we ought to be in this season. So okay. uh, over to you, Dolly. Okay, I'll, I'll be very brief. And to be honest, I also need to go and eat. I've not eaten <laughs> dinner. Um, so I'll try and be very brief and I'll honestly still share the slide um, that I shared on, on, on that question. Not my entire screen, sorry. I want to share this slide um, on these skills. So it, it relates to exactly this slide that I was talking about. I created this word cloud based on skills and feedback that I've received at work, right? So when I talk, okay, I, I think at McKinsey, the model of feedback was every two weeks, you see to the project manager that you're working with and you ask them what they think about you, whether you're doing well on the project, what you can improve on and what they presume or what they've observed as my strengths and what they've observed as areas to improve on. We never call them weaknesses. Um, and so for me, this word cloud was definitely generated from that. And it's everything that um, Madame Dorcas has also spoken about. It's the eagerness to learn. It's your ambition, which of course stems. I think this one thing that I've really observed across the entire kind of communication, uh, full circle with Dorcas, with myself, with um, Saya, is that it all comes from within, guys. Like, honestly, it all comes from you. All the power that you have all the value and all the addition you bring to the world comes from yourself. Like there is no other dolly in this world. There never was, there never will be. So I have to make sure that this dolly kicks us and leaves a mark in this world. So put, uh, replace dolly with your name and just, you know, make that affirmation. Like there is no one else in this world. And so, that's why I really, I put authentic as the biggest thing because what you have to offer to the world is very unique and very different. Like I can never offer what Jojo offers. I, or I use Jojo because she's one of my biggest supporters in this life. I don't know what I would do without her. Um, and things like that. Like what Jojo brings to the world is very different from what I bring to the world. And somehow we support each other in that journey. Somehow she's able to see what I bring and I'm able to see what she brings. And in the end, a huge oh yeah, I, I see who is talking. So these are the skills. I think the presentation will be shared with you. Um, but these are the skills that you need to display. Like you need to be very focused, you need to be 
very creative in what you do. You need to be humble because you will, like I know in my consulting role, I've worked with people who are double my age. And so being humble and respecting them for who they are and for the experience they have, while as well bringing my perspective in a very, very clear way has been something that has been important. Um, I just also want to rush to the question that someone asked about stakeholder management. Um, especially during this virtual point or this virtual interaction, how do you make sure you navigate that clearly? It's just employing exactly all the tactics that you would employ if this person was next to you, right? You would maybe go and check on them every hour or every two hours. So why not call them? Like right now, the only difference is you have to transition to online means of communication. So do that. Like make sure you talk to them in a very ethical way, in a very professional manner, and just make sure that that you check on the progress of what they're working on. If you're trying to engage new partners, especially if you're a startup and you want to get donors involved, etc. It's all in how you message it, right? It's in saying, this is what I've done, these are the things that I've achieved. And you also have to find what exactly am I working on that really, really interacts or attracts this donor. So if this donor is interested in this space, then I have to make sure that how I position my message, like, Actually, think of it this way. When you're doing your cover letter, it's never the same for all kinds of jobs you're applying for. When I'm applying for a healthcare role, I will talk more about my healthcare experience. When, I, when I'm applying for a job about financial services, for example, a banking kind of project, my cover letter is very different because I want to speak to what I will offer. I will offer you my vast um, um, experience in designing strategy across East and West Africa. I will offer you very great problem solving skills, especially when I was digitizing a bank. But when I'm doing healthcare, I will definitely twist that cover letter. And so that is how you manage your stakeholders. Make sure you tailor your communication to what their needs are. Um, and sorry, I just also wanted to share this um, as my parting shots so that I can go on what you call it off video and eat. Um, this was my parting shots that you are the man or the woman in the arena. And this is a post that was made by Brene Brown. If you've noticed in the comment section, I really talked about Brene Brown a lot. Um, she quoted Theodore Roosevelt. And this is what Theodore Roosevelt said. He said, it is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer or the deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat, who strives valiantly, who at best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring great, greatly. This quote honestly keeps me moving, right? If you critique me and you've never been in the arena, my dear, I'm not going to listen to you. Honey, just, you know, keep talking. I'm going to walk. Um, but if you critique me and give me feedback and I see the sweat and blood of you as well being in the arena, I will definitely listen to you. So always also, like feedback will come your way a lot. Just make sure you also have a sieve. Not all feedback is helpful. Like that is one thing that I've also learned. So make sure you're also able to balance that to know it's not a critical count. People will critique you because they are super wimpy and cannot put themselves in the arena. But you keep doing whatever you're doing. Be in the arena, keep daring greatly, and everything else will work out. And I think that went very well with this verse, Proverbs 14, 23, that says, all hard work will bring a profit, but mere talk leads to poverty. Power to a kongea, you know, empty debes, kongea, empty talk. Um, th that leads to nothing. So always just have that kind of balance um, when you're working and when you're trying to deliver your best. I think, yeah, I will end with that and then I will go off video so that I can eat. <laughs> um, but I hope it's been helpful and the presentation will definitely be shared. And oh, one thing I also wanted to mention, I really, really felt so small to be part of this panel. Um, and I hope in very small ways, I've been able to um, ignite some thoughts in you. And I think I want a date with Saya. Saya, I need to deal with imposter syndrome. It's what I'm suffering from. So when you have time, let's have a chat or do it on your YouTube video and then I'll watch. Anyway. <laughs> holla at you, boy. Holla at you, boy. <laughs> yeah, I'll holla at you. But thank you so much. And um, I hope you benefited a lot. Bye. Cool. <laughs>
Thank you, Dolly. Thank you, Dolly. Uh, you are actually the David of the, of, the, of, the, of the webinar, so don't feel small. You are really big and you have inspired a lot of us here, myself included. So in the interest of time, I want to rush. We can allow you, Dolly, to just go offline, get your food, but still we'll be getting in touch with you. Just be online. Um, <clears throat> in the interest of time, I'll jump to Brother Sire. There was a question on how do you motivate yourself to stretch till your farthest length? Add to it, uh, what are the practical ways to changing a mindset? So I want you to deal with that, and then we can deal with the other question that is talking about how does one stretch in a depressing work situation and environment? And let me combine it, uh, the, the depressing one, with another question uh, that was asked here. How do we deal with horrible, inconsiderate, and toxic bosses? My bosses, or, or rather some bosses, can take advantage of employees' agility and give them a lot of work to do when others don't want to do that, and they don't compensate them for the same. So I think, Saya, wow. I'm making your hard work uh, difficult, but those are, the, <laughs> those are the four questions that I really want you to deal with. How do you motivate yourself to stretch till your farthest length? What are the practical ways to changing a mindset? That was attached to the one for stretching. And then how does one stretch in a depressing work situation and environment? I believe that one is related to it. And then finally, how do we deal with horrible, inconsiderate, and toxic bosses? Wow, if there's ever a mashakura of, of questions, that one. <laughs> it's, it's very mashakura, but we'll do our best. Learning is a science. Learning is a science. I'm a learning scientist. Been doing that for the past five years now. And the simple quick answer on how to build a positive mindset and to you know to to stretch is three r's let me make them memorable by putting you three letter r's one is reasons two is rhythms and three is relationships then i will explain what that means one is reasons two is rhythms and three is relationships reasons talks to the intellectual component of what we are doing. So if I want to develop a positive mindset, that positive mindset needs to be built on something firm. There's a whole industry of empty motivation where all we put together is um, intelligent quotes. That's not what builds resilience, okay? That's not what builds real people. So if you, um, in, in the words of the Bible, it says the eyes are the light of the soul, but if your light is darkness, then how dark your light must be. So in, to put that simply is, if we are going to build to be resilient people, the basis of our knowledge, the basis of whether it's self-knowledge, um, industry knowledge, belief knowledge, belief system knowledge, relationship knowledge, all of these things need to be built on something firmer than uh, a catchy phrase. It needs to, we need to, we need, and this I need to speak directly to millennials and Gen Z, we need to be willing to build our reasoning base beyond the length of a tweet. If the most long thing we can read is the length of a tweet, bear in mind that the problems we've been building, the corrosion of our confidence, the building up of our imposter syndrome has been with us for well over two decades. To hope to solve that by something the length of a tweet is not going to work. So the first R in building a positive mindset, in rebuilding yourself, in building resilience, is to build reasons. Reasons is, what's the knowledge? So I want to build a positive mindset about myself. So one of the things I need to do in R is get a proper knowledge of myself. I like the way Ellen White says, self-knowledge is one of the most important things of a human being. Because if you're self-deceived, you will act in ways that are not consistent with reality. So number one is build reasons. One of the things we've been doing on this call when, and brilliant job, Madam HR has done an outstanding, outstanding job. Yeah, of, of course, first with the looks and then next with the content. It's just given us a solid basis for um, knowing what the future looks like. So it's not just catchy phrase of the future of work or the future of working or the future of jobs or the future. No, it's just given us terra firma, something we can hold between our teeth. And we need to begin doing that with whichever domain we are struggling with. That is reasons. The second is rhythms. And this is a problem, especially with African, more specifically Kenyan education systems. We have made a 
distinction that is not very helpful in education is we go to school to learn, then we go to work to work. Life in reality does not work that way, okay? The artisan who is being taught to be a plumber or a, or a, or a, or a um, carpenter does not go to carpentry school and then comes to make beds. No, the artisan is taught about making beds while making beds. So the second way we build our resilience is by rhythms. Rhythms is creating intentional um, spaces, intentional environments, intentional opportunities where we get to begin working out the various things we want to see ourselves growing into. So question in case in point is, I want to lose weight. Let me just use that as an example. I want to lose weight. It is not I go read a book on weight loss for six months, then I come and try to do that. No, today I read something and do a workout. Tomorrow I read something and I, and I change something on my diet. The next day I read something and I change my sleeping habits. So you learn by doing. And the more of such rhythms you keep creating within your life, they become, the way it says you saw a thought, it becomes, um, a hab it, it becomes an act. You saw a heart, it becomes a habit. You saw the habit, it becomes a character. You saw a character, it becomes a destiny. So that habit, intentionally creating what I call rhythms, opportunities where we can take what we learn in reason and convert it into things that we can be able to institutionalize in our daily fabric until it becomes second nature. Opportunities to be able to take what we learn and be able to subject it to the real world and test its assumptions, test its veracity, test its usefulness, get feedback and keep iterating. That's what we call rhythms. And then the third R you need in this building process is called relationships. Relationships are made of people we build with or people we build for. People we build with and people we build for. Every of the mindsets we are trying to develop, every of these positives, we things we're trying to build, will either impact others or will involve others. So the better we learn how to build those communities that give us feedback or the community that give us more resources that can be able to support us in that journey, the best for us. So case in point, I, um, I have just graduated from, from school and I want to begin making a career shift from, say I did law and I want now to become a learning designer. What do I do? I need to begin placing myself where I can learn more about learning design. And learning design can be learned anywhere, can be learned, can be applied, sorry, anywhere. I can begin doing learning design for low students. That is reason. And then rhythms is I begin approaching my friends who are doing Kenya School of Law and I begin offering them something to help them. That is called rhythms. And then as they try it and it gives them help, they give me feedback. And that is called what? Results. I mean, and that is the relationships. Now you notice something. As you do that, it builds the confidence in you. The reason many of us go through school, enter the job market before we build the confidence is because we devote 16 years to building reasons and not enough time to build rhythms or relationships. So we come out with a lot of head knowledge, but a lot of imposter syndrome, a lot of lack of genuine confidence because we have never acclimatized. We have never been able to put out something there, gotten feedback from it and been able to grow through the process. So we plod through the first decade of our employment experience, feeling like underdogs, going through with a whole lot of imposter syndrome. Um, how do I do this in a toxic environment? The answer for that is fairly long than time will allow, but for us to be able to navigate toxic environments, the tool or the skill we will need to develop is the ability to give ourselves permission to have difficult conversations. That's, I think, one of the topmost skills we need in life. The, uh, the permission to give, the, we need to give ourselves a permission to have difficult conversations. Now, difficult conversation is anything where the stakes are high and the outcome is unclear. So I've read the question about hey, a boss who gives me four people's work with one person's salary, I'm worth of it. People will only treat you the way you allow them to. Even your boss will allow you to treat you the way you, treat, you, you allow them to. But you see, one of the things that speaks to it there is, at least for starters, 
He's doing that because you're a good worker. Okay, you have ability, that's why he's pushing it. So there's something working for you in that particular situation. However, now you've placed yourself in a position of exploitation. So what needs to happen there? And unfortunately, I won't have the time to delve into the meat and cream and bones of this. But what you need is, because the whole science of having difficult conversations is wider, and maybe a substantive topic on itself. But what you need to do is give yourself permission to have difficult conversations with other people, with a clear understanding that people will treat you the way you permit them to treat you. That's a very top level answer on that, but I hope the initial few pieces will be of help. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Brother Saya. And I think uh, if time could allow us, and uh, if uh, we had the energy and you are not hungry, we would stay here for longer to continue you know, learning from our panelists uh, today who are oozing nothing but uh, a lot of wisdom here and a lot of practical uh, skills that we are learning here that we can actually implement immediately after this. And that's really the essence of these uh, forums, that uh, we want to move out of this and immediately hereafter we have practical things to apply. And I like the way from our first speaker, Dorcas, uh, the high level breakdown of everything, how it's happening and the practicality of it and application to Kenya, coming to Dolly, and then uh, uh, the, the exact uh, way you should you should work as, a, as an employee in the practical things that uh, make her an outstanding uh, employee yeah. that you can apply after this. And coming to Sarah with all the transition, how do you transit and how do you become a better person? You know, uh, and how do you continue growing? How do you become resilient? All these are rich topics that you have covered today. I believe you have been uh, really uh, nourished uh, by them. <coughs> and uh, so many people asking for the recording. This surely must be must be sent to all of us. We must listen to this again and again and again for it to sink into our minds. So thank you very much for our panelists. We cannot thank you enough. Uh, we appreciate your efforts. We appreciate your content. We appreciate your time for, 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 for coming to, to spend the time with us here. I'd also like to appreciate a friend of mine from Madagascar who joined us. So this, we are going international bit by bit. Uh, but you're not mentioning it, uh, so we thank God for that. So I have my friend uh, from Madagascar, and uh, he's uh, Harinjanka. Uh, and the other name I cannot uh, mention, I think I'll make a mistake. Uh, this is my friend, I think we met in the US, and uh, now we are good friends. Uh, he might be in one of our soon-to-come webinars. So. Thank you very much, all those who joined from Nairobi, all those who joined from outside Nairobi, all those who joined from outside Kenya. We hope to get uh, guys from, uh, I, I'm told there's also South Africa. So really these are continental webinar here that we are having here. So our speakers, you are, your reach has been wide. Uh, so your efforts has not been uh, in vain. And I would like to mention that this is the only webinar where the numbers were increasing as we were moving to the next speaker. Most of the <laughs> webinars you get to 50 minutes in and people start going out. But this one, people are coming in up to one hour, one and a half hours later. We have Uganda also, awesome. Even Migori County, <laughs> so, 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 so this has been very insightful. And just to mention that uh, in our next uh, webinar, before I hand over to the leadership to help us close, in our next webinar, we shall be diving into the conversation about how now do you transit in these shaky times? How do you, there are those who would want to transit from uh, eight to five employment and uh, into self-employment. And you're looking at self-employment in two angles. There's the freelancing or what you're calling the gig economy. And also there's the entrepreneurs, the startups. Uh, where do you start? How do you get into it? Uh, how does the terrain look there? Is it an option for you to go there just because you have lost a job or does it need some specific skills and thick skin? Uh, are there specific people who are cut for that? And you have a very good uh, panel lined up for that too. So you, you don't want to miss that. We invite our panelists also to be part of us in our next panel, uh, in our next uh, session webinar. I'm glad to report that we had our panelists from our last webinar also joining us today. So next, next week is going to be bigger, it's going to be better. And uh, there'll be a lot of contributors from across the world. We'll make sure that we have at least uh, four continents uh, in this. And I have them all lined up. We have friends from all over. I don't want to spill the beans yet. But uh, let's, let's continue the conversation. Today we have, I think, polished you as employees. Next time, let's think about how do we move into 
for those who would want to take options of a side hustle, those who want to, to do a freelancing, those who want to get into entrepreneurship, how does it look like and what should you consider? So thank you very much. From me, I've been your moderator. I probably did not introduce myself fully. So I can introduce myself because our panelists have been, have been very awesome. Just remember me as uh, Jeremy Riro, who goes to New Life Church, where Dorcas used to worship until 2017. That's how I'm related with Dorcas. Yes. Uh, you can also say that this is Jeremy Riro, who went to school with Dolly, the super employee that we had today. We studied together at the University of Nairobi. And uh, you can also say that this is Jeremy Riro, who is also a Mandela Fellowship, uh, a Mandela Washington Fellow, just like Jackson Sire. So that's me to you, and uh, good night, guys. Over to the leadership. Uh, Chadwick. Chadwick, if you can hear my voice, can we? <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, we would like to thank you all for uh, attending, and I would like to thank our panelists, uh, Dolly, Dorcas, J Jackson, and Riro. And I would also like to appreciate our leaders who helped in organizing this, Wayne, Betty, Jim, may God bless you, and even uh, Dr. Kemi. Uh, otherwise, uh, uh, otherwise, uh, I would like to ask Joel to pray for, for, for us, and then everyone will live at their own pleasure. Thank you for attending, and we hope that you will join us again next week. Uh, Joel Mutugi, if you can hear me, please offer the closing prayer. Joel has left. I'll ask. I'll, I'll ask. Uh, Sheko Tieno to close for us. Then, Sheko Tieno. Uh, thank you very much. Shall we bow for a word of prayer? Are you getting me? Yes, yeah, sure, sure. Gracious and everlasting master what in heaven, thank you for the gift of life that you have given to us. Thank you for the knowledge that you have given us this evening. Thank you for our speakers. Thank you for everyone who has been participating in this wonderful location. Lord, how I pray that you give us good health. How I pray that you protect us over this night. Among this pandemic period, Lord, let us also find the best way to serve you, Lord. Be with us now for, and forevermore in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for You can us. live at your own pleasure. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody.